Um, um, I have a quick uh, announcement to make regarding uh, this committee. As chair of the House Legislative Administration Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency controlled by the governor, declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic in accordance with House Rule 67 and the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. This is a public hearing on bills referred to the committee and scheduled in the House calendar for today. An executive session may be held on any bill referred to the committee. Please note that there is no physical location for members of the public to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting. However, in accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that all members of the committee and select legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through the Zoom electronic meeting platform. And the public has access to contemporaneously listen and if necessary, participate in this meeting by the Zoom platform or by telephone. All necessary access information has been made available in the House calendar and through the electronic calendar on the General Court website. The notice for this meeting complies with House rules and RSA 91-A. Anyone who has a problem accessing the meeting should call area code 603-271 three six zero zero or email h c s at ledge dot state dot nh dot us in the event the public is unable to access the meeting the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance when each member states their presence, please also state whether there is anyone in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. With that, I'll introduce our uh, legislative administration clerk who will call the roll. Representative Hill. I'm here in the committee room. Representative Green. I'm also here in the committee room. Representative McKinney. Here at home alone. Representative Packard. Representative Aye. Osborne. Representative Ruliard. I'm here in the committee room. Representative Simon. Here in the committee room. Representative Wall. Here in the committee room. Representative Lay. He will be coming right. Representative Smith. Present remotely, I am alone. Representative Frost. Was that me, Frost? Yes. yes. I am present remotely. Um, I am in common area with my family. Representative Lai Wong. I'm here alone at home. Representative Richards. Representative yeah, yeah. And uh, Representative Ian, I'm here in the committee room. Can everyone hear all right? Yeah, I my name wasn't called. There's a representative of Skipia. Yeah. And you are home alone? I am home and alone. Thank you. Um, everyone is here. Uh, we have House Bill. 156 uh, to be heard. And I will recognize the prime sponsor is Rebecca McWilliams. Mike is all Welcome to Legislative Administration. Thank you, Chair Hill and members of the Legislative Administration Committee. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Representative Rebecca McWilliams. I represent the west side of Concord. Uh, this is my second term as a rep. 
And so um, I am bringing forth House Bill 156 because I believe that there are some things we could do better when addressing bills. Um, so it's a fairly simple bill, but I think it would make a big difference for um, transparency when we're addressing bills. So to dive into the language of the bill, let me make sure I have it pulled up on my screen. Uh, this is about amendments for bills uh, being shared with anyone who wants to see what's going on on the House uh, website. So as you, I'm sure you all know, but I'll go through the process anyway. Um, when there is a bill being heard in committee, uh, either the sponsor or a member of the committee or another representative, sometimes co-sponsor, uh, may propose an amendment. They'll go to the LOB, they'll explain what the amendment is, have it drafted. Um, now that drafted amendment is still confidential. The only person who has that amendment um, is the is the person who requested it until it is disseminated and shared with the other members of the committee, uh, lobbyists, the general public, spread far and wide as the person who drafted the amendment decides to do so. Um, I think there probably are some good reasons to keep amendments confidential. And so I'm not going there with this specific bill. I'm not changing that at all. Uh, what this bill does is once the amendment has been discussed and adopted by the committee, it allows that amendment to then be published on our House website. So when anyone, member of the public um, or another uh, person who's not on the committee, wants to see the status or what's going on with the underlying bill, they're able to click on and see the amendment on our House website. So that's what I'm proposing, and I'm glad to take questions. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions from anyone in the committee? Mm -hmm. sure. Thank you for your testimony today. Can you hear me all right? You're a little faint. I'm going to turn up my volume. Okay. My, my question is, uh, have you discussed this with our clerk and others in the house who put our bills and such online? Are they willing to do this? Are, are they in the process? Or are they thinking, wow, this is a really new idea. We need to do this. I have not had a conversation with Paul Smith's office about this specific bill. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone on Zoom have a question? Seeing none, I have one. Um, you mentioned that there may be good reasons for con confidentiality. Uh, how would how would someone determine um, whether and how they protect their amendment for confidentiality if they chose to? So this bill is about uh, an amendment that's already been voted on by the committee. So by the very nature of the way we have public hearings, the amendment is technically public at the time that it's being voted on by the committee. So there's no confidentiality past that point. But in terms of strategy, I've certainly seen prior to committee meetings, there may be multiple amendments floating around depending on how complex the bill is. Uh, and some of those don't ever get presented to the committee. They're just discussed amongst different interest groups um, before it's refined and finally presented. So the confidentiality piece may be um, negotiation or strategy or keep this in, take this out. Um, I don't think that those specific things need to see the light of day necessarily or need to be transparent to the public. But certainly once a committee has voted and approved, then confidentiality goes out the window because it's public record, um, you know, it's already happened. Thank you. No other questions. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, Chair, next we'll call uh, our house clerk, Paul Smith. And I think you are good to go. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of my favorite committee. I hope everyone is uh, doing well today. Um, I am here at the lovely State House. It's it's nice and springtime out, out front, as you can tell by my picture. Um, so so yes, to to uh, 
address Representative McWilliams' uh, uh, point. And by the way, I'm, I'm sorry, I should state, I'm the House Clerk. I'm, I'm not testifying in favor uh, or opposed to this uh, particular piece of legislation, just to share some uh, simple issues with you. Um, uh, fundamentally, um, we don't uh, have, uh, we, we tend not to put the internal processes of the House in terms of in, into law. Uh, those are those are things that we we try to deal with as as, as most as we can uh, within um, existing practice. That being said, I do want to share with you that this uh, particular issue is in fact under development right now. We are rolling out a new website within the next couple of months, and I have asked the chair uh, to allow me to share my screen, and I want to show you how that's going to look. So, if you will bear with me for a moment, you can see here. Um, uh, you're all familiar with the landing page of legislation right now. As a matter of fact, uh, what else? Let me stop this one and share you the normal uh, web page. Um, <clears throat> so you all are familiar with our um, our landing page. And on this page, you, you can click to the docket, uh, to the bill text, to the status. Uh, once you get through the session, there's a, uh, a history page as well. If there's audio that's been recorded, et cetera, those will all link here. Um, what we are moving to, and let me just go back to it again, and I apologize, um, is, is sort of a newer mechanism where uh, we will have a landing page that's sort of similar to this, and everything will be available right here on the left-hand side. And that includes the amendments. Um, Representative McWilliams is correct that, that amendments are kept confidential until they are introduced by the individual members. Uh, we, and that, that process is never going to change. Um, and just to be clear, um, amendments are, are often drafted uh, for a variety of reasons, whether they're going to be put forward or not. Uh, I think back to uh, the former member from Ware, who as a member of the Finance Committee would would frequently have 45 to 50 amendments drafted and then only offer 10 or 15 of them. Uh, but they were just sort of back pocket type of items. Um, and while this was certainly a cumbersome uh, task for our, our folks in OLS, um, you know, it, it did um, provide for, for you, the members, to have what you need. Uh, so again, the the plan is at, with the new website that's being worked on is that all of the amendments um, will be linked here um, and available on the page when you get to um, that website. So uh, although I, as I said, I, I'm not um, here to testify against the legislation, I would simply state I don't think it's needed. Uh, A, because our, 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 our typical past practice is that we do not put internal functions of, of the legislative process into statute. Uh, however, we, we also, um, we do this kind of thing where, where we advance in technology and, and, and post these things up uh, as we move forward into new centuries. So happy to take any questions if anyone has any. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Uh, are there any questions from anyone in the committee room? Seeing none, anyone on Zoom? Uh, again, Mr. Chairman, just uh, just thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak to my favorite committee today, and we'll see you all later. Thank you, Mr. Clark. You say that to all. Um, have a great day. We'll see you a little later on another bill, I believe. Um, our next person to testify would be Alvin C. Can you please bring him up? Mr. C, are you unmuted? Okay, thank you. I'm uh, unmuted. The uh, camera doesn't seem to unmute. There it is. There you uh, are. The uh, Zoom process blinks off and then has to restart again whenever whenever you uh, um, promote a person. Anyway, my name is Alvin C. I am uh, uh, from Loudoun, and I'm while I'm supporting the bill, I also would like to say that I support what the uh, clerk just uh, talked about um, and like the look of the new page. 
Um, I had an experience just a couple weeks ago where I had, um, uh, where one of the committees was talking about an amendment. And of course I wasn't able to see the amendment because it hadn't been posted or anything. Um, and so I'd called into the state house and ended up talking to two people before I talked to somebody who was able to, who had access to the, uh, amendment and was able to email it to me. Uh, so that was very helpful. And, uh, thanks to Pam Smarling for that. Um, I would like to suggest that amendments are posted as early as possible, uh, including before committee hearings where, where the uh, uh, people who may want to testify should know what the amendment has in it uh, in case that changes what they would testify about. Uh, I find it frustrating to testify about uh, a bill and then find out that there's a, an amendment that's eliminating part of what I was testifying about. Uh, also for floor amendments uh, before house sessions, they should be up uh, the day before so that uh, um, any citizen who wants to contact their uh, representative or senator for that matter uh, would be able to do so before the session. And with that, I thank you and uh, be happy to answer any questions. Mr. C, uh, did you have written testimony, Mr. C? I, I didn't, but I can uh, put this into an email and send it to you. I think that would be helpful to our clerk. Um, does anyone in the committee room have questions for Mr. C? No. Anyone on Zoom? We have a representative Is it? New entrant? Yes. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. C. Um, next, uh, the chair will call uh, Representative Horrigan. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I, I don't have written testimony uh, on this bill. Um, I just decided to, uh, I just decided this morning to chime in. So I, I agree. Um, I agree that this is an excellent idea of making it easier to see amendments. That's been something that has uh, frustrated me throughout my like 13 years in county as a state rep. That's very hard to keep track of uh, amendments, and it may suffice just to have you know a central place for them to be, like where the clerk is, because before they're sort of distributed on paper, and procedure for distributing the paper was extraordinarily haphazard. So I can't remember how many times somebody brings up an amendment in committee or even on the floor and you have no way of getting a copy of it, or at least no easy. Well, the committee, of course, you can always have the committee assistant back when we're doing it the old fashioned way, go and make a copy. So, and there's also, uh, there's also a lot of gamesmanship that takes place, especially in hearings where the prime sponsor will have a bill that lots of people hate, and then they'll allude to an amendment, which none of the opponents have seen. So that's, uh, that often plays you in a frustrating situation where you're, uh, Place. And I suppose also sometimes when you're favor of the bill, when you're speaking to something that isn't what the committee is going to be considering, and that's uh, that's extraordinarily frustrating. Although I mean, sometimes that's not, I think it's changed from the floor amendments. If and when we're ever meeting in Rept Hall, they hand them around to the rows, and that's uh, the traditional practice. That, in my opinion, uh, Sergeant Arms Office and Clerk's Office work very hard to make it happen, but we've uh, there's been many, many times when nobody, not everyone gets the amendment and there is, and uh, sometimes there's a stack of them out of the ante room, sometimes there isn't. And of course, if you're in the audience or, you know, either up in the gallery or watching on uh, watching on uh, streaming video, you have no way at all of knowing uh, <laughs> what the floor amendment is. So having a central place to put the floor amendments um, is a good idea. And um, that can probably be done without, before this bill is, uh, Passed, I think it'd be a good idea. And also, uh, I'll just mention back during the drive in session, um, we had the Senate uh, amended a bill that at least uh, some of us were planning to consider on uh, the floor or the tarmac of that session. And um, I don't know why that never came to the floor, but part of the problem with Outlet's that uh, somebody was going to have to go around and print 400 copies and go around the golf cart to all 400 cars. And I'm, uh, I don't know all the details of it, but I'm not sure. Any provision had been made to make that possible. Certainly, it didn't happen. That amendment, the amended version, 
from the Senate uh, was never distributed to the members, so we never had a chance to consider it. And that's uh, an election law bill, which the Senate was hoping to have passed that very day, so the governor was ready, apparently ready to sign it and stuff. So we lost an important bill um, that way related to election law. But So I just want to say, I think this is a good bill of Representative McWilliams, and um, regardless of whether or not, this, and even if we, even if even if this doesn't get passed, it helps start the discussion. And um, I certainly appreciate uh, the work the clerk's office and IT are doing on it. So that was a very, uh, I'm glad I tuned in to see that presentation from the clerk. So that's, uh, but I, I, that's just what I have to say in support of the bill. So thank you. I can answer any thank you, Representative Hargan. Uh, does anyone have any, you will take questions, I assume? Sure, why not? Yeah. Are there any questions from anyone in the committee room? Anyone on Zoom? Seeing no questions, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that concludes all of the people that signed up uh, prior to eight o'clock for testimony. Um, so we have a hand up for this. Uh, great. Joe Hand, uh, of the panelists, and he wants to speak on this bill. Joe Hannigan? Joe Hannigan. Uh, Joe Hannigan. Are you available to speak and can you hear us? Now I can, sorry, I just lost you. Uh, good morning, members of the committee. Thank you for hearing me today. Uh, I'm the Vice President for Gunners of New Hampshire and I'm here to speak in favor of the bill. Um, I, I just want to do- honorable Joe Hannon, is it not? Uh, well, sometimes, yes. <laughs> Thank you, the honorable whatever, that's fine. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, I, I do have one question. Are there any amendments to this bill? Um, that we don't know about. So I'm just kidding. So <laughs> basically, I, I, I do appreciate uh, what the clerk said about, and I do like the uh, new landing page that they're developing. Uh, I do think it's very important that the public be aware, whether you're for or against the bill, to know what's coming and what people are talking about. I've been at dozens of hearings where they're talking about an amendment, and then I'm asked to speak on that bill, and I have no idea what they're talking about, uh, unless I'm actually there and have been given a copy of it. Uh, someone spoke, I forget who it was, about, uh, you know, the people that are the insiders or the people who know what's, you know, are working on bills in the in the state house. Um, I don't think it should just be limited to those individuals who are either lobbyists or activists who show up at the Capitol. I think everyone deserves to know what's coming down the line. Uh, I put in a bill back in 2016 when I was a member, uh, House Bill 1465, just asking for roll calls to be put in. Uh, onto the website. So when committee roll calls were done, any motions made would be posted. And I, I remember speaking to the clerk at the time. And uh, by the way, the bill was killed in committee, your committee seven to zero. <laughs> but uh, I was told that it was uh, something that was in the works. And, and actually today we do have the ability to go to the website and see what the roll calls are for the votes. Uh, not all the specific motions, but it is there. I think that uh, as long as the, the clerk's office is developing a website that has everything that's uh, completely transparent to the public that happens in that in that honorable building, um, I, I'm, I'd be content, but I do think it's important to keep pushing forward. And if, if it takes legislation, I, I, I appreciate that very much. Will you take questions? Uh, honorable Joe? No, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I'll take questions. Yes, I thought you were asking if there were any. Well, uh, are there any questions? No. Are there any on Zoom? None. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Good to see you. You, you too. Well, you didn't see me, but thank you. <laughs> um, I think that concludes the testimony. Oh, sorry. At the very beginning, you asked. Um, oh, well, we, we can do that. We can do that. I just thought I would announce that there are on this list that came through by eight o'clock. There were fifty people in support. I'm not going to read them all. Um, no one opposed, and one person neutral, which I think was the post clerk. Um, and that's all I have for now. With that, I'll close the hearing on House Bill 156.
What time's the next one? Yeah, okay. 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 Mr. Chairman? Yes. Oh, this is Betsy McKinney. I don't know how to answer, ask a question. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, on this bill, it says made public or presented to the policy committee. I think you have to um, take public out. And I'd, somebody has to ask Paul about the floor amendments on the. Uh, anyway, now that I've figured out how to ask a question, I will at the proper time. Thank you. <laughs> Betsy could call. Uh, yes. Yes. And she was here. I don't. I didn't remember her. She did not testify. No, but she was in attendance. Um, we vote ready. Yes. And we're on 190, right? So it is now 930 by our committee room clock. Um, I will open the hearing on House Bill 190, which is relative to financial disclosures by legislators. And do we have anyone to introduce the bill? Yeah, the sponsor. Great. Um, so if if Representative Gordon is on. I am. Ah, sure. perfect. Representative, you have the floor. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, for the record, my name is Ned Gordon. I represent Grafton County District 9. And more importantly, for the last legislative session, I served as chair of the Joint Legislative Ethics Committee. This bill House Bill 190 is relative to financial disclosures. This bill uh, was actually Senate Bill 500 in the last session. It passed the Senate, came over to the House, and because of our circumstances, was never acted upon in the House and wasn't passed. The bill is uh, quite simple. It deals with financial disclosure forms. Under the current law, Legislators are required to fill out a financial disclosure form every year. They're required to fill it out by the third Friday in January. And then the forms are to be reviewed by the Legislative Ethics Committee and then sent over to the Secretary of State. Uh, the, the, as, and as legislators, you all know that you recently filled one out. Filling out the forms, uh, what we've discovered is uh, we fill it out in the first year of the session. And generally, there's no need to fill it out in the second year because people's circumstances haven't changed. But if their circumstances have changed, they're still required to fill out declaration of intent forms if, in fact, they have a conflict. So there really is no requirement or should be no requirement to fill out the financial disclosure statement every year. In addition, uh, it's really a problematic for the staff in that they end up having to chase down 400 legislators every year to get those financial disclosure statements. And it's a, it's a burden, not just on the coordinator, Rick Lambert for the ethics committee, but it's a burden upon the staff uh, for both the Senate and the house offices to chase down people. It's just not an easy thing to do. And uh, it takes a lot of time. And unfortunately it's just wasted time in most cases. So this bill basically says you need to fill out the financial disclosure form on the first year after you're elected to your first year of the term, you do not have to fill it out in the second year. 
and that's as simple as it gets. I'd be happy to answer questions if anyone has any. I think you said you had, would be willing to take questions. Yes, I'd be more than happy to take questions. Uh, does anyone in the committee room have questions? Seeing none, anyone on Zoom? I see one hand, two hands. Uh, looking a long way here, I'm going to say it's Representative Pichia. It's Pichia, you know, no good try, Mr. Chair. Um, but thank you. Um, my just question is, if circumstances were to change, you know, from one year to the next, would they be required to file, um, you know, an update? I know that, you know, changing it from, from two years to one year, but things change. I you know I've changed jobs within a year. Um, would that be something that uh, we as legislators would have to do? Uh, I don't, I don't think that you would have, uh, you could file an update, but there's no requirement that you file an update. But you, you, if, if in fact a conflict should exist or uh, it develop in that two year period of time, you are still required to disclose that uh, conflict and you're required to fill out a form which is called a declaration of intent form and disclose at the time uh, or just before you act on any legislation over which you may have a conflict. Follow up? No. Uh, did I see Representative Frost with their hand as well? No. I think we're all set, uh, Representative Gordon. Yes. Representative Richards. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And to follow up um, on the previous question, um, it is there any intent or open to any potential amendment that in the change of this, um, that you do ask not only for the declaration of intent for the conflict of interest, but if there is a change in the financial disclosure, um, that there is a update process. Um, so, we file in the first year, but are required to make an update process if there is a change, not only about the conflict of interest, but on the financial disclosure. Just being very transparent to our constituents. Uh, you, you, could, you could require that if you, uh, if you think that's necessary. Um, I guess if you had a change of employment or you came into some financial resources that you didn't previously disclose, uh, you could do that. I, I, I can just tell you, I, but I think the issue is the committee isn't going to be able to monitor that. The committee, the ethics committee basically acts mm -hmm. when we're requesting to act. So if somebody files a complaint, we act on the complaint. If somebody asks us for an advisory opinion, we act on the advisory opinion. Uh, we're required by law to review the financial disclosures at the beginning of every year currently. Uh, but there would be no requirement for the ethics committee to uh, review updates. And I'm not exactly sure what value it would have. I, I think it would have value if you weren't required to file the declaration of intent form in any event. So if, if you do end up having a conflict, you would in fact have to disclose that. Mr. Chair, can I have a follow-up? Follow-up. Um, to your example, um, I'm just thinking about a situation um, and I'm not sure it would matter, but let's pretend that um, uh, I won the lottery. Um, and in that instance, um, 
for the purposes of the ethics committee, um, I would not necessarily have a conflict of interest, but would that, I'm, as I'm talking this through, it may or may not be important information since you're required, you know, financially, would that be of interest to review with your requirement for a yearly review of those financial forms? Would that perhaps be an in, a time in which it would be important to provide for this update process in your work in the ethics committee? This is me as a new committee member kind of learning through this process. So I appreciate you um, educating me and taking this question. Well, I guess we, the, the, the way you would look at it, thank you for your question. They, uh, the way you'd look at it on the current form, you're required to disclose your sources of income over a certain limit over thousand dollars. So you, would have to disclose that. The question is, would that in any way create any conflict for you um, in the course of your conducting your business as a legislator? And I'm not sure that would create a conflict for you. It's, I think part of the reason for disclosing your sources of income is, you know, if your source of income is from a particular type of company that does a particular type of business and, and then you act on legislation that would directly impact that business. Or as we saw in, in, the, last, in, the, in the last session, if, if, if you work for a union, for example, and then you acted on union legislation, um, that would be important to disclose those things, but simply winning the lottery, I'm not sure how that would impact your duties as a legislator other than the fact you might not want to be a legislator anymore. <laughs> All set? Yes. Thank you for your testimony, uh, Representative Gordon. I think you're all set. Thank you very much. There's a hand raised, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Yes, uh, Representative McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think if you look at line six, it answers the questions. It says, if the legislator or office's financial circumstances change, he or shall file a new financial uh, disclosure. So I think that kind of covers what the last few questions have been about. It, it does. Uh, but I, I have to tell you that uh, it's, it's rare that we ever get a a, a, uh, an amendment to a financial disclosure. Out of sight, out of mind. <laughs> I think I think people look at it as an obligation that they have at the beginning of their, at the beginning of the year, and generally they have to be reminded of it. But after that, uh, it's it's not something that's on the front of their minds. Anything else, Representative McKinney? Yes. Fine. <laughs> Any other questions from the committee? Home, telephone, Zoom, anything? Nothing. Thank you, Representative Gordon. Thank you very much. Uh, no one else has signed up in support or to oppose or neutral uh, on this. You would like to speak. Co-sponsor. Co-sponsor. You would like to speak as co-sponsor. Uh, I recognize Representative Wall. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, and thank you, uh, Representative Gordon, for your excellent testimony. So there's very little I have to say. Um, I'm Janet Wall, and I represent the uh, towns of Durham and Madbury Stratford District 6. Um, I'm in strong support of this bill, and I just want to remind everybody that it's a nuisance for everybody to have to fill out their disclosure form every single year. This is a problem for the Ethics Committee for a long time, as well as for a number of the members. Uh, this is a bill that is requested by the Ethics Committee. It is a bill this committee had last year, passed the Committee on Vice Fall, 
pass the House on a voice vote. Should have been on the omnibus bill, but was slightly overlooked. So we brought it back this year because we know that not only do legislators want it, but uh, staff really needs this. It's really difficult for staff to keep chasing after representatives who, at the beginning of each year, are very, very busy. And we have to go after people and ask, have you filled out your disclosure form? Would you please fill it out? Do you intend to fill it out? And almost everybody's always very, very cooperative, but um, it just takes a tremendous amount of time on behalf of Rich Lambert, who takes care of all this, who's the administrative, um, executive administrator for the ethics committee. So this will not only streamline our process, but will also just be a convenience for everybody all the way around. So I strongly support this, and would only remind people that if changes occur, that you need to disclose during the year. Um, we'll probably put putting something in the calendar or announcing on the floor of the House or Senate so that you can uh, follow up if there are changes in your life. So thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Wall. Any questions for Representative Wall? No one, I see no hands. We're good to go. Thank you. Uh, if there's anything else or else I will close the testimony on House Bill 190. Thank you. Uh, what time is the next? So we've got uh, 15 minutes or 14 minutes or so to our next bill, House Bill 509. Give you a few minutes for a refill of your coffee or, or not. Thank you. And uh, I, would, I would just remind committee members in the room that the, unless you mute the computer up by the big screen, you're you're unmuted. And if you would like to mute it during breaks, that that's fine. But somebody just needs to remember to unmute when you're ready to resume. So we have to go all the way up there to, to mute you it. Do. I can't unmute you from from up here. It's messages because the tech person said we didn't have to. So you prefer that we go up to the chair and see what that back to the No, no, no. She's talking about muting the, go up there. the room now. I'm just reminding you that that whoever's in the audience can can hear you. And not that you would say anything inappropriate, but just um, it feels like you're alone sometimes when you're not quite alone. With my back to you. <laughs> I think our security person. Oh, I asked if she had, had any discussions with any staff, especially the most clerk, who were responsible. Putting our information online. Right, so no, he's not. Security guy, because we were supposed to be 40 hours. Yeah, Obama says that. Right. Unless this is a work problem, so with the right to know, I don't check that they're not going to put it online. So I guess it's kind of important for some people. So, Greg, so I'll just sit there with my back to everybody. But remind me if you can't hear me. Yep. Um,
Yes. Oh, my God. Uh, this is the clock now saying 10 o'clock. Um, I think we're ready to go. Almost. Almost. Uh, so Representative Blay is now with us. Everyone all set? Clerk is all set? Uh, good morning. Um, I will open the house, uh, the uh, testimony for House Bill 509. Uh, this is a relative to portraits and memorial objects in the State House, Legislative Office Building, and Hubble Walker House. With that, I will recognize the prime sponsor, Representative Wall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, I'm Janet Wall, and I represent Stratford 6, the towns of Durham and Madbury. And I'm presenting House Bill 509 today. It's a bill that uh, we had last year. On a voice vote last year. It passed the House on a voice vote last year. It was to have been heard in the Senate, but of course, uh, March 13th came and went, and everything changed. Uh, this was then to have been put on the omnibus bill, and it just didn't make it there because there was so much else people were dealing with. So we have agreed to sponsor it again this year. This bill comes to us at the request of the Joint Historic Committee, which makes up members from the House and Senate. This is an issue that has been on our minds and we've tried to deal with for many, many years. And we've decided it's finally time that we file a bill to see if we can straighten out and clarify uh, the responsibilities for the placement, as you can see in the analysis of the portraits, flags, bust statues, or other memorial objects within or on the state legislative office building of Walker House grounds, inside or out. Um, this is a bill that's needed because as space declines in this area, we're finding it harder and harder to know where to place objects of importance. So what this bill says, if you look at your bill on the back side, the changes that are made are uh, the areas that are defined more clearly as to where we can place our objects. Now, uh, it has always been that the committee has no say over what happens on the second floor of the State House. That is the governor's territory. We can deal with the first floor and the third floors, but we cannot deal with the second floor at all. So as portraits come in, um, space is getting limited. And it's something we're going to have to deal with over time. Um, there is concern about where objects are placed as well as portraits right here in the LLB. Um, we had a portrait that was given to us last year for former Speaker of the House, George Roberts, who made it possible for us to have this legislative office building. And the portrait hangs downstairs now, right next to the desk where we all come in. Um, there was a concern as to exactly whether that was the right spot for it or not. It may seem like a minor issue, but it becomes a big issue over time. Once again, the space becomes more limited. So it's a very simple bill. It's just a bill to clarify uh, where we place these objects and who has responsibility. Uh, it used to be that the then former director, now passed away, of the visitor center would place portraits or objects in even the state house where he thought they might look good. And while it doesn't work that way now, the law states that we have to confer with the committee. So again, this is a simple bill, simply clarify who has the responsibilities, what those are, and again, it's long overdue. It passed the committee on a voice vote, the House on a voice vote, and we anticipated it would have passed the Senate as well. Uh, my name's the only one on it this year because even though there were others on it, they simply didn't get around to it this year, but they, former sponsors whom I can't recall now, were all in favor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh are there any questions? I assume you will take questions if there are any from the committee members. Anyone on Zoom or on telephone have questions? Representative Rula. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, thank Representative you. Wall, for presenting this bill. The question I have is on paragraph two, which is the new paragraph added. And um, although we're talking about 
uh, the state house and legislative office buildings, um, the state house has all of those flags. It does that change the movement of how those flags can and should be moved from what's currently in place? Uh, for a while, to, thank you very much for your question. There was a subcommittee at one point regarding the flags, and we have talked for a long time as to what to do regarding those flags. There are people from the outside veterans who want very much to take those flags, remove them, and put up um, replicas of them. Uh, we're not going to do that. Uh, this does have, this committee does directly have the, uh, the decision making on the flags and what happens with them. Um, there was a flag committee, I said at one point, but we no longer have that. Follow up? Follow up, thank you. Uh, so my question is, if this bill passes, how does, whether or not the flags that are there now, how does that affect whether they are moved or not moved? This doesn't change anything. The same responsibilities go to the same group of people. And they will, when the time comes, there is work going on uh, with conservatives that now that the conservative will be called in for reference as to how we can best deal with the textiles that are there. Some people claim that the flags are falling apart, uh, that they're deteriorating badly. There is no proof of that whatsoever. Uh, one of the flag cases was opened this past year and determined that nothing is crumbling, nothing is falling down. This uh, case is actually are hermetically sealed. And uh, so nothing is going to change there unless there is uh, another subcommittee at some point set up and the funds are available. Right now, nobody is going to do anything with the flags because all estimates coming forward say it cost in excess of a million dollars. And we don't have the money. Thank you. Any other questions for Representative Wall? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't see anyone else signed up to speak. Representative Raymond, are there any telephone calls? No? Okay. Um, I will tell the committee that uh, there were no people signed up in support. There was one opposed and none neutral. No other hands up. Oh, I see Representative Lay with a hand up. Could you tell us who was opposed? Uh, yes, uh, Representative uh, Howard. Okay, thank you. Representative Howard. That's all. Do you know Representative Howard? Uh, yes, I do. I don't have any idea why. Uh, he, he hasn't spoken to me about it. I have no idea. Um, he, he did say, even though as an elected official, he was representing himself in this. So. Um, that's all I can tell you. <laughs> Nothing else from the committee and no one else to talk to no one else. on Zoom or by telephone. So I will close the hearing on House Bill 509. Our next bill is 558 at 1030. So you've got 20 minutes. This is not an easy thing to schedule, I got to mm -hmm. tell you. Uh, you're on your own till uh, 10.30 for House Bill 558. Uh, if I may say, Mr. Chairman, I just want to thank you for um, scheduling uh, a large number of these bills on the same day. You know, sometimes it's been difficult in the past when we've had hearing days with only one or two bills spread out, you know, over months and months. Uh, this is a lot easier, I think on a lot of our schedules and uh, it is difficult uh, for, for the chair to predict how long these hearings are going to be. Uh, but I, I just like to thank you for putting these all on the same day. Oh, thank you. Yeah. For, uh, um, I will tell you it, a lot of it isn't my fault though. Um, 
a lot of it is because uh, the committee was not assigned any um, uh, early bills. So we kind of uh, were put in the position of, of uh, getting the room when it's available for our bills. So it just seemed logical to, uh, to put as many as we could here. And, and the fact is that we're all in this little learning curve for doing things differently than we used to. And, uh, and so it's, uh, it seemed to make sense to put these bills first so that we get our feet under us uh, before we get going on, on Monday with, uh, with probably our busier day. So, but thank you for saying so. I'd like to offer a hearty second on that. <laughs> thank you, doubly. Uh, we're gonna mute for a while, folks.
he could come over at that time. Yeah. I mean, this was his cell phone. I think we are good to go. Time being 10 30. Uh, we can get the technical advice from our vice chairman. I think we're good to go for our opening the hearing on House Bill 558, which is establishing a committee to study the use of information technology in the legislative process. Uh, the chair would like to hear from the prime sponsor, Rec Wilhelm. He is on. He's on. Rec Wilhelm, your, the floor is yours. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Chairman Hill and honorable members of the House Legislative Administration Committee. For the record, my name is Matt Wilhelm. I proudly serve as a state rep for Hillsborough County's 42nd District, which includes uh, Manchester's North End, the downtown and historic Milliard. I'm here this morning to introduce House Bill 558, which would establish a committee to study the use of information technology in the legislative process. Over the last 11 months, the COVID-19 pandemic has challenged the legislature, like every other workplace around the world, to adapt its business processes to keep its members, staff, and the public safe. At the New Hampshire State House, both chambers have effectively leveraged 21st century information technology, including video conferencing for public hearings and committee work, which removed barriers and increased access for many members of the public who might otherwise face barriers in order to participate in our democracy. As many of my colleagues know from personal experience, driving to the State House in Concord can involve upwards of three hours round trip, which doesn't even consider hurdles like uh, taking time off from work and or making arrangements for childcare. In particular, the opportunity for our constituents to provide virtual testimony has leveled the playing field for many of our neighbors who serve as primary caregivers, who work Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., and or reside in our state's more rural and remote communities. Uh, as proposed in House Bill 558, a committee to review and study the use of information technology in public hearings and committee meetings uh, would also develop a training needs assessment for legislators and staff to effectively utilize commercial IT software for legislative work. Uh, it would evaluate the technical staffing and logistical needs to continue the use of video conferencing. It would determine administrative costs to sustain the use of video conferencing. Uh, it would review House and Senate rules to identify which uses of IT are currently permitted and what changes might be required uh, to further authorize the use of video conferencing for public hearings and or committee work, uh, and it would research other states, counties, and municipalities authorization and use of IT uh, in the lawmaking process. Uh, so I'd urge my colleagues to send House Bill 558 to the House uh, with a unanimous recommendation of ought to pass so that we can take time this summer, uh, perhaps even over Zoom, to consider the strengths, challenges, and opportunities for our colleagues, staff, and constituents as it relates to the great experiment into which we were forced as, as committee work went online over the last year due to the pandemic. Uh, thanks for your thoughtful consideration and I welcome your questions. Thank you, Representative. Uh, welcome back. Um, anyone in the committee room have questions for the Representative? Uh, do you have written testimony, Rep. Wilhelm? I do. Would, you, would it be helpful to email it around to the committee? It would be extremely helpful. Great. It would be my pleasure. Thank you. Um, any questions? Yeah, I see Representative Doug Lay with his hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Representative Wilhelm, for taking the question. Um, so the focus here is on legislative process within the New Hampshire General Court. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so uh, I was wondering then on, um, I think it's letter D, this is uh, part four, Roman numeral four uh, D, um, explore any technical staffing and logistical needs and costs facing local communities to access meetings and hearings. So is this just to have them access meetings and hearings of the general court? Yes, 
Yes, it is. And I think the, the thought there, if I may, is to uh, think about how uh, rural communities that may not have ready, readily available uh, broadband, broadband access uh, that we might be able to partner with, say, a community college uh, that does have that infrastructure so that members of that community can testify. Uh, Mr. Chairman, follow up? Absolutely, follow up. Thank you. Um, I might suggest uh, you just sort of specify um, to access meetings and uh, of and hearings of the general court. That's all um, there. Might just be a, a sensible uh, change. Um, the other quest, the other question that I have is on Part Five, Roman numeral five, letter F. Um, what would be other remote areas of New Hampshire? <laughs> I'm in Ringe right now. Is that a remote area? I live in Jaffrey. Is that a remote area? Um, I mean, I, I recall the genesis of this, uh, and so I understand the, the mention of Coas County, um, but why make specific mention of one county and then just sort of leave it vague as to other what other areas might be considered remote? Yeah, thank you, Representative, for the question. I, I do think it has to do with the origins of this bill. And I think we could we could easily strike co-ops as not to pull out a specific county, but I think it was really used as an example of, of uh, you know, again, the, the origins of the bill, but also uh, to, to provide an example so that people really understand. Yeah. There, there are some, some people that have a, a lot harder of a time getting to Concord than others. Right, understood. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from? Uh, yes, I have. Expedia, uh, you had a question. Representative, do you need to unmute? Don't see him showing anymore on the screen. Camera came off. Uh, are y'all referring to me? Oh, um, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I had a question, but then I, I, I put my hand out. That's my fault. Um, but I, I actually, I do. Can I ask? Can I ask something, Mr. Chair? Absolutely. Um, so, I one of my questions for for Matt, uh, Representative Wilhelm, is how like do you know how much you know how much participation has grown amongst folks um, like different groups um, and their experiences? Like, has it been has it been a good experience for folks, especially who are uh, who are coming in this uh, using using Zoom? Uh, I thank the representative for the question. I think this is uh, a really great question that the committee should get into. I have heard anecdotal uh, feedback that uh, people have had access to the legislative process in a way that they hadn't in previous previous sessions. So, um, you know, I think to put some data to that could be really helpful and, and, you know, makes a lot of sense for this study committee to dig into. Follow up? No. Anyone else on Zoom or on telephone with a question for Rep. Wilhelm? Uh, one question here, Rep. Wilhelm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question on page two line 28, um, reporting the findings and recommendations. And it goes to the clerk, the Senate, the House, the governor, and the state library. Why does it go to the state library? Thank you, Representative, for the question. My experience uh, chairing a commission, a study commission uh, last year, uh, was that that was standard protocol for all study committees and commissions that it get archived in the state library. Thank you, I didn't know that. Question, Mr. Chair? Uh, yes, is that Representative Smith? Yeah, uh, thank you, um, Representative Wilhelm. Um, 
Would you uh, agree in a very general sense um, that more easier public participation in the legislative process is generally a good thing and something we should seek to encourage and explore ways to enable? Uh, thank you, Representative, for the question. Uh, my answer is yes. And that I think that the New Hampshire Constitution in outlining a 400 member uh, House of Representatives uh, with you know, the opportunity for legislators to introduce bills for every bill to get a hearing, for every uh, bill to get a vote in committee and for every bill to get a vote on the floor, um, you know, as is the tradition of the House, is uh, very much in line with a transparent, open process that wants all voices to be heard. And I think, uh, you know, we've stumbled here into, uh, you know, an opportunity uh, to engage more people. And I think ultimately that's a really good thing for our democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another hand up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is uh, Representative Richards. And um, to follow up on the work of the study committee and um, Representative Wilhelm, your comment about the data um, and trying to find data about um, the increased participation. I have a couple of constituents that are in um, departments of the state. Um, is that something that we could be sure that the study commission um, surveys or provides data um, to this process on their experience um, with our um, year of pilot programming with these um, uh, Zoom hearings? I've heard, as we've just all mentioned anecdotally, but these were in particular two folks, one from Fish and Game, who's a constituent of mine, and one from um, Environmental Services. So um, two, you know, two important departments that are really telling me that this has been a great process. Thank you very much for the question, Representative. I think that we should absolutely hear from executive departments uh, to hear you know, what their thoughts are on uh, this, this pilot, as you put it, which I think is a great way to describe it. Um, and I think we would welcome, uh, you know, any, any ideas and perspectives about how we might want to move forward. Follow up? Nope. Are we all set. I see no other hands up and no one in the committee room. Uh, thank you for your testimony, Rep. Wilhelm. Thank you. Chair would like to call uh, the House Clerk, Paul Smith. And we should be up and ready to go. You need to unmute. Is it him or us? It's him. Mark, you need to unmute. <laughs> I can't hear. No. No. I see him screen where he's on the screen here. Hand up. There he is in the bottom right. Uh, is it? Yeah, it just kind of hurts the whole time for asking how to do things. Mr. Clark, why don't we try to solve our technical issues and then we'll come back to you. Mr. Chairman, um, uh, here he is now. He was um, on another meeting or issue. 
Sorry about that, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I was actually, um, <laughs> I was sorting out voting devices for our session uh, that's coming up later this week. And um, because we're doing separate entrances, I have to go through and um, separate them by party and then alpha. And I, I apologize, I got a little hung up on that. Um, the uh, uh, the bill before you, um, I just wanted to, to throw out there um, that uh, uh, as you all know, many of the practices that we have put in place for the pandemic, um, we have done um, initially last year, we, we adopted some of those things because of the emergency order. Uh, when, spe when Speaker Shirtliff um, made his uh, declaration uh, regarding the rules for remote testimony, that um, was a, a, an interpretation based on um, the, uh, the allowance of uh, RSA 91A having been relaxed through the emergency order. Um, as you know, for this session, we have actually adopted a rule um, that permits it. Um, so I, the, the only point I'm trying to make here is that uh, um, we know that rules are what governs how we operate. Um, and uh, you're certainly welcome to, to study um, various aspects of, of how we operate and those sorts of things, but uh, we know that in order to make things happen, uh, rules govern how we work. Uh, and that's basically all I just wanted to say. Again, Paul Smith, House Clerk, uh, neither in favor nor opposed to the legislation, just, just throwing that out there that, of course, I'm a resource to you all the time. Uh, as my good friend, the member from Manchester knows, uh, who's uh, pushed um, his rules amendment a couple of different sessions in a row. Um, I was very happy to work with him in drafting that. I'm always happy to work with members uh, on rules. That's always been uh, something irrespective of, of party, who, who's in control, whatnot, that doesn't change. So uh, rules are, are, are my focus and what I, what I work with you all to, to, to help implement. And uh, I'm always here to, to assist you in that, so. You want to you will take questions, I'm assuming, Mr. Clark? Of course, Mr. Chairman. Always happy to take questions. Uh, from anyone in the room on Zoom, I see a hand up, Representative Frost. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Clark, if a rule is adopted as it is now that we can meet remotely and the public can testify remotely, um, if isn't that subject to the whim of the the next legislature, say. I mean, uh, how, how easy is it for a rule to be rescinded, to take a, a access away? Uh, that's that's a very good question. Um, I am, am always the first person to tell somebody that once you ring a bell, it's hard to unring it. Um, so, I mean, that's that's sort of my my professional opinion to folks. Uh, that being said, I would note that the the rules provisions uh, that we adopted this year uh, to allow for the meetings as we currently have them um, are are actually uh, temporary rules anyway. Um, the 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 proviso at the beginning of of House Rule sixty seven stipulates that uh, at the conclusion of the state of the mer emergency um, that this rule that does allow for this basically self terminates. Um, so we would be sort of back to the process uh, as we know it, knew it before. Um, but again, as, as I mentioned, uh, how, how we do change the actual processes are through rules. So if you all wanted to uh, make this a permanent structure, uh, that would be something we would do through rules. I would also note um, that uh, we do have, uh, in this instance, uh, the, this year, because of, of the extraordinary circumstances we're in, we do have the ability to amend House rules on, on Wednesday again with a simple majority vote, um, which, which, we, which was extended uh, because usually the first session day is uh, sort of the last day to amend by, by majority vote in a, in a given situation. Um, but in, uh, you know, as you know, one legislature does not bind the hands of the next either. So, um, a, a new legislature could implement on uh, almost immediately on the on convening day uh, those new structures for for how you want to have a a, a set policy. Follow up. No. Anyone else on Zoom or on in the room or on a phone have a question for the House Clerk? Just Steve. a. 
just a clarification, Mr. Chairman, earlier when I was testifying and, and you stated that um, I said that this was my favorite committee to all the committees, that is in fact very untrue. This is really truly my favorite committee having served on it and because of course it has to deal with the internal workings of the house, so. <laughs> now we, now we have it. <laughs> <laughs> Testing the veracity of my statement, I suppose. No, <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm not testing that, but something that you did say, um, mm -hmm. Mr. Clerk, that um, I wanted to ask a follow up on was, has there ever been a study committee prior to a rules adoption, thereby um, allowing more of a process, I guess, to create a uh, a rule that's a really good ringing of the bell, um, if you will. In your experience, have you seen that as a part of the process in the creation of a rule? Uh, so the short answer is in my 18 years, no, I have not. Um, I, I would say that um, Part of part of the the, the process, as as you all know, uh, I know that one of the one of the groups that uh, is is listed as as being a resource um, has lobbied very heavily on on these these types of issues in the past. Um, and that is certainly well within the purview of, of any member of the public and any lobbying organization. Um, I would only note that uh, rules tend to to come from um, it's, it's actually interesting. I was, I was having a conversation with a member of the committee earlier. Um, and I noted that, that sometimes when, when, when rules come, it's because of, uh, something that we, we've sort of, uh, evolved with technology. Um, I will state, you know, prior to 1976, we did not have a roll call machine. Um, so, so keep that in mind that before 1976, our 400 members were roll calling every individual roll call, you know, in a half hour period. That's why there were much fewer roll calls. Um, but we, we do have to adapt uh, our rules sometimes for those changing technologies. In the case of the bill I testified on earlier, um, there are certain practices that we ju that just make sense um, and, and including like putting amendments online. So that just makes sense. So we don't really need to address it in rules nor in my opinion in statute, because we're just moving in that direction. Um, I, I would also note, um, you know, that, that our rules talk about um, printing of bills, but uh, we actually, before we get our bills back from the printer, we actually post them online um, sort of as a convenience sake before they're even back from the printer. Uh, so I, I only note that because, you know, uh, we, we, we try to do things generally um, it, it, because we've we sort of gotten to that point or evolved to that point. Sometimes, uh, and, and I'm, I'm sorry to keep going, but sometimes, uh, you know, rules are a response to certain things as well. Um, you know, some of the rule changes that I've advocated over the years, specifically like um, uh, the, the amendment we adopted uh, in session a few weeks ago that, that deals with committee of conference reports and, and how we adopt uh, something um, that hasn't, you know, that really hasn't had a public hearing or something along those lines. Um, you know, in, in eating two thirds, that's because that that evolved because of of the actions of of our neighbors across the across the wall that that like to do silly things. Um, so, uh, you know, that's why we we sometimes uh, do the rule uh, changes as well. We Sorry for the very long answer. <laughs> we uh, we're done with our favorite testifier, um, Mr. Chairman. I have a question. Uh, yes, Representative Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, your your testimony focused a bit on the the rules aspect of this, um, and you you just mentioned um, the other chamber on the other side of the wall. And I noticed the study committee is not narrowed in scope to the House. Um, it is dealing with the the general court in general. Um, and as a matter of fact, the the clerk of the other body um, would be a member of the, the study committee. Um, just, just to clear, in, sorry, go ahead. Uh, their, their interpretation of whether or not they need rules to use technology um, is basically the exact opposite of ours. You know, the, the position of our, our chamber's leadership um, 
seems to have been that, you know, we, we need a rule in place before anyone like dials a telephone. Um, the, the other chamber has taken the exact opposite approach. They're, they're are utilizing, you know, extensive technology, not just for their committee work, but for their sessions without any adopted rules proactively allowing them to do that. Um, my, my question and my concern I'm, I'm hoping you can speak to is, um, given that dichotomy, are, are you aware or have you been privy to any conversations um, on any attempt to like rectify that between the two chambers and get some sort of a paradigm that matches uh, in the future? Because, you know, and where I'm going with this question is I, I would hate to see a report come out of a committee like this that has a few specific recommendations and have them adopted by one chamber, but not by the other. Um, fantastic series of questions. And I'd like to sort of address a couple of those if I could. So, so first and foremost, the, the house, um, as you know, with a bigger chamber, and, and this is sort of true in many states around the country, the House utilizes more terms, uh, more in terms of, of backup and precedent. We use Mason's Manual of Legislative Procedure in the House of Representatives. The Senate does not. The Senate literally looks to its own rules. And that's why if you, if, and I know you are an astute observer of the Senate, they say without objection, probably 25 times during a session day. And the reason is because they're sort of waiving really any, any sort of formal acknowledgement that, that, that they're doing anything extraordinary of, of rules. So I, I understand your point, but I would just state that we are a completely different body in that sense. Um, regarding, you know, and, and I think that addresses your point, certainly with, with respect to, to the, the interpretation of rules regarding technology. Um, I, I will note that we did have a study committee a couple of years ago that talked about recording of, of committees. And it was something that uh, was studied. Um, actually, the, 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 the current uh, minority leader was the chair of that committee. Um, and uh, I participated with that. I would also note too, that this legislation actually does not make the, the clerks members. It's, it would just have us referred to uh, as being persons to, to consult with. Um, and, 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 and that's fine. Um, but yes, we, we have in the past had joint rules with the Senate. The, the, the last time we had joint rules with the Senate was the session of 1995 and 1996. Um, uh, so when you and I were in high school, Representative Smith, and, and I would just note that, um, you know, in, in, in those terms that we have attempted, I will say this for my own sake, when I first became clerk, uh, in 2014, um, then Speaker Jasper met with then President Morse about the idea of potentially adopting Senate, uh, uh, joint rules with the Senate. And that was summarily dismissed. Uh, by by our friends in the upper body, um, and and so I, I I would just state that that you know, in terms of of practices that are that are branch wide, it's it's hard to do that when you operate so differently, um, and and again part of it and, and I, I look to the staff for example, each senator is is accustomed to to having at least one staff person working for them, uh, whereas. Uh, you poor folks uh, sometimes have to do your own photocopying. And, and I, um, you know, it, it's funny to me uh, that, that, that it works that way because you, you make the same amount of money. Um, but that, that being said, uh, you know, there, I would only note that, that in the instances of the House and the Senate in terms of policies and, and procedures, the things that really affect us that, that do rise to the level of joint issues, such as last year when we adopted, or a year and a half ago when we adopted the discrimination uh, and harassment policy uh, in law uh, that, that actually set a position uh, within the uh, General Court Business Office and, and that sort of thing, that very much, um, did deal with a branch-wide system that, that sort of transcended uh, the political nature of, of, of the two bodies. Follow up. Oh, thank you. I think we're all set, Mr. Clark. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. See you all. Uh, next, the chair would like to call 
A.T. Pierce, representing herself. Is here? Oh, I'm so proud of She said she is testifying for five minutes. I would hope she could shorten that. Good morning. Yes, I can keep it under five minutes for sure. So um, hello, representatives. My name is Daisy Pierce, and I'm the executive director of Navigating Recovery of the Lakes Region, which is one of several recovery community organizations throughout the state. And I am testifying today in support of HB 558. Although many communities in New Hampshire would benefit from the continued ability to testify remotely, such as I am today, I wanna speak specifically on behalf of those in recovery from substance use disorder. Right now, there are currently eight bills related to matters that affect treatment and recovery with many more in prior years regarding recovery housing, Medicaid expansion and reimbursement rates, drug courts, syringe service programs, et cetera. People in recovery throughout the state are actively engaged in civic duty and their voices deserve to be heard when it comes to issues directly impacting their lives. However, testifying in person is not always feasible. Uh, I think the language of the bill says it perfectly. Quote, the use of video conferencing technologies, among others, enabled legislators to participate in hearings from their homes or other remote locations and eliminated barriers for members of the public for whom it can often be costly, time consuming and logistically challenging to attend committee hearings in person at the state capitol. When speaking to those logistical challenges, let's begin with transportation. For those without their own vehicle, having to pay for a taxi or Uber fare is uh, cost prohibitive to Concord. In addition to that, arranging for transportation back home can be difficult when you don't know how long the hearing is going to last or when you will testify. When it comes to public transportation, we can all acknowledge that we're woefully lacking good options for buses. Even for those of us with our own transportation, driving to Concord to testify can cause other issues, and I'm not referring to finding parking. Um, another logistical challenge worth mentioning is employment. So for example, taking the time off of work, if an employer will even allow it, cannot cause financial distress on someone. Many people in early recovery are getting back on their feet. They don't have high paying salaried positions, but rather minimum wage hourly jobs where every penny earned is needed for basic cost of living. Yet their voices are just as important as those who can afford to take the unpaid time to testify. Another barrier to those in recovery testifying in person, particularly during this pandemic, is that of underlying medical conditions. According to the CDC, although the risk of severe illness from COVID-19 for people who have substance use disorder is not known, they do know <clears throat> that many serious effects that drugs have on the body to the lungs and the heart could make COVID-19 illness more severe. No one should ever have to risk their own health in order to participate in the legislative process. So I want to be cognizant of your time today, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of those in recovery supporting HB 558. I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, first question is, do you have written testimony that you are submitting? Um, I can submit what I've read today, yes. That would be wonderful. Uh, does the committee have any questions? Being none here, any online or on Zoom? I think you're free to go. Thank you very much for testifying. Uh, chair will call the murder this one. Um, Ed Chenchala. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify. I have prov Can you hear me okay? Yes, you're welcome. Great, thank you. Uh, I have provided written testimony that I won't repeat. Uh, I, I'm the CEO of Amanusic Community Health Services and we're in Littleton, New Hampshire. And I've had the privilege through the years to testify in person in Concord. I love coming to Concord. And then it often entails um, 90 minutes round trip and although I can get some work done on the phone during that trip, 
uh, this experience has provided myself the opportunity to provide input in a variety of bills that I hope help legislators craft bills that are cognizant of rural northern New Hampshire. And in addition, I serve on the Shawship Commission as well as the Medicaid Adult Den Benefit Commission. And the ability to contribute at a more meaningful level is greatly enhanced by the ability to use a platform like this. And we have uh, many patients, we have 10,000 patients, some of whom is, would like to have their voice heard. And as was previously mentioned, transportation is sometimes a challenge. 40% of the patients we serve are Medicare eligible, so they're over the age of 65, and some are less comfortable driving in January and February. Uh, so I appreciate the opportunity to leverage technology to participate in sessions like this. So I'll say thank you and I'll echo the words of the clerk that, um, you know, this is, this is um, I think it, it really brings New Hampshire together and gives a voice to 1.3 million people who have an opportunity to have their voice heard, uh, perhaps more than they've ever had the opportunity with more barriers removed for them. Um, and I still enjoy coming to Concord when I can. Uh, so I, I will leave it at that. And if there are any questions, I'm more than happy to respond to them. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Any online or Zoom? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you and have a great day and a great legislative session. Thank you. Okay. Um, next, we will call Heather Young. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Legislative Administration. Thank you. Um, thank you, Representative Hill and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Heather Young. I'm uh, representing Community Support Network in Concord. We are the association to the 10 area agencies in the state of New Hampshire that provide services to individuals with developmental disabilities or acquired brain disorders. Um, we support almost 13,000 individuals in this community and their families, and we are asking you to support House Bill 558. Um, as the association, we do provide um, education and training opportunities for individuals with disabilities, uh, acquired brain disorders, and also their families and staff members um, working with them to participate in um, educational opportunities with the legislative process. So many of the bills that get submitted each year do have a direct impact on the people that we serve. Um, and we often hear that it's hard for them to participate given um, some of the challenges that have already been mentioned here. Um, some of those barriers do include lack of transportation to Concord, uh, workforce challenges that the entire state is experiencing. The amount of time that it takes to get to and from, um, as mentioned before, if you live over on the seacoast or up in a rural area, it could be a four plus hour round trip. Um, and that is if the hearings do run on time. The, day, the time of day for public hearings is hard for our families, especially those that are um, supporting young children who experience disabilities. Uh, they're often shifting them from one therapy or appointment to another um, and taking a lot of time off to help support that. So it's important for them to get involved, but sometimes um, this would be kind of the last thing based off of other important things that the families have to experience. Um, COVID-19 has brought significant challenges to our state and communities, but it has also given us the opportunity to experience what it could look like if a remote option um, was here to stay for the future. Hearings are more accessible, uh, they're convenient, and the legislators get to hear more from the public members on how bills do impact them. Providing the option for remote testimony in the 2021 legislative session has removed some of those barriers um, that have been discussed. And, um, sorry, I just got a pop up that threw me off guard. Um, 
So people have been able to provide uh, important feedback to the legislators and we have heard from families that they're, they've been able to participate a lot more and we are um, getting constant questions on how to help them navigate through signing in a public hearing um, in support and opposition to, and we hope that it helps them to see the process and empowers them to continue being um, part of the legislative process so that legislators can hear how bills do impact them. Um, so we do hope that you support House Bill 558 and we're happy to be a resource along the way as needed. Thank you for your testimony. Will you take questions? I certainly can try and I will just add, I did um, provide written testimony that you all should have as well, but yes. Thank you. Are there any questions? None from the committee, any from Zoom or online or telephone? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Next, the chair will call Viola Tadassini. How did I do? Uh, from Granite State Organizing Project. Good morning, members of the Legislative Administrative Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. Hey, My name for this pronunciation of your name. Katsusime. Thank you. For the record, my name is Viola Katsime and I'm here representing the Grand State Organizing Project. Uh, the Grand State Organizing Project is a grassroots nonpartisan organization that brings faith, labor and community groups to work towards a more just world. Uh, I'm here to express our support for HB 558. Uh, in most of our work at the Grand State Organizing Project involves working with low income families and communities of color. Uh, we are dedicating to ensuring that people are participating civically and they feel empowered enough to participate in decisions that affect their day to day lives. We view HB 558 as an opportunity to expand access to the legislative process uh, so that more Grand Staters who feel that this door is currently shut have uh, a regular way of participating um, in this process. Uh, during the 2021 legislative session we're in currently, we have witnessed an increase in participation among our members. Uh, they have become actively engaged in the legislative process because now they can attend hearings online, they can register their positions for bills online, and they can testify from the comfort of their homes. Some of our members, are uh, limited cause of transportation. They don't have cars and there are few trips to Concord provided by the public transit. Even a trip from Manchester to Concord by local transit could take two hours. And let's not forget the fact that hearings sometimes run late. And so uh, if you're in Concord and you're there for a hearing and you have to go back to work for a second shift, you might not be able to make the hearing and um, be able to share what your experiences are because you have to go back to work. And also going to Concord is not um, an, a comfortable thing for everyone. It can be very intimidating, but now that people can actually call in and share their stories and share their experiences from the comfort of their home, they feel very comfortable to do that. Um, for instance, we have uh, members who are parents and they have kids at home. And for that reason, uh, it's been a challenge for them to drive to Concord and then come back uh, and make sure they're taking care of their kids. So we find that that is a barrier for them to participate in this process. So I want to uh, urge all members of this committee to really consider this bill, to make sure that those that don't have voices right now to be able to participate in this process, have that access, that their stories can be heard. Um, and so I really urge you to vote out to pass on HB 558. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, would you be willing to take questions? Uh, sure. Are there any questions not within the committee? Any online or I see no hands? Uh, thank you very much for testifying. Uh, next, the committee will, uh, the chairman will call Jake Berry. Uh, from New Futures. Mary should be good to go. 
Okay, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, honorable members of the committee, my name is Jake Berry. I'm the Vice President of Policy at New Futures. As many of you know, New Futures is a nonpartisan, nonprofit health policy and advocacy organization. To advance responsible and inclusive public health policy, we work with individuals and organizations throughout the state to help them engage in, in the legislative process. I don't want to repeat too much of what you've heard this morning, but I do want to emphasize New Futures strong support for this bill. Uh, many of you may recall that I was here before you last year prior to the onset of COVID-19 supporting uh, a similar bill to look into opportunities for remote testimony to empower and raise the voices of individuals across the state who are unable to get to the state house for committee hearings. In the months since, you and your colleagues here in the legislature have learned in real time how to open a remote option for individuals to testify from home or from their communities. We thank you so much for your patience and support as this process, as this system has been put into place. With any luck, the COVID-19 pandemic will soon come to an end and the health challenges facing many of us will recede. But for thousands of Granite Staters, the obstacles that prevented them from attending and testifying at committee hearings in the first place will remain. Uh, including geographic, physical, and economic hurdles that often uh, prevent you from hearing from many of your constituents, uh, including working professionals, working parents, those with physical or behavioral health challenges, and many others who are so directly impacted by the work that you do. Now that we've opened this door to them, we think it's critical that we keep it open and allow their voices to continue to be heard uh, to inform the critical work that you're doing. We believe that the committee proposed under House Bill 558 will serve a critical role looking into some of the challenges uh, facing the system and identifying technical staffing and other needs uh, to maintain this remote option going forward. With an aging population that's growing more diverse culturally and economically, maintaining this virtual option into the future will continue to bring in important and underrepresented perspectives and will strengthen our legislative process on the whole. Uh, and with that, uh, we ask that you support the bill and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm assuming you have written testimony? Thank yes, you. I've sent you a uh, written testimony, yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? Not from this, any on Zoom or on telephone? Seeing none, thank you very much. We have no other people that have signed up. Um, I will ask if there's any members of the public that... Uh, Great. Oregon. You should be able to go. Hello again. Hello again, Mr. Chair. I, I think I neglected to formally introduce myself um, when I was here a few hours ago. Um, so I, I continue to be Representative Timothy oh. Oregon. I continue to represent um, Trafford County District 6, Greater Madbury, the towns of Madbury and its uh, suburb Durham. Um, anyway, so I, I think this committee is long overdue. Um, I've been serving, I was elected in uh, 2008. And even then I thought the way we did things was in many ways uh, antiquated. I mean, I like, like the clerk and like the previous clerk, Karen Wadsworth, I'm an old school type of person, but still um, I think there's a lot of changes that should have been made many, many years ago. Even the things we're doing now are really not cutting edge technology. Um, some ways we've moved, we've moved, uh, we've moved backwards. Like, uh, and first of all, actually I'm a, uh, my father served in 1976, which is when the uh, push button roll call system was put in place. So that's how old that technology is, even though we did put in a new server uh, um, since I've been here. Um, some ways we our infrastructure has gone backwards. Like we used to have uh, the state house annex used to actually be a annex of the state house, so we had a lot more uh, space and a lot more uh, facilities back then. And um, and or uh, some ways we in some ways our technology moved backwards. Like our streaming video until uh, until the pandemic came along was just a little webcam mounted on the rail um, in the uh, state house. Um, we had my first term. We actually and I'm not sure all the details of how it came to be or why it was done, but like a local public access channel actually had a professional camera uh, down there. So the sound quality in the video, I think sometimes even used multiple cameras, woohoo, which uh, is a, and, um, and of course that, that technology has been around, uh, you know, C-SPAN was invented in 1979, various legislatures like the Massachusetts state legislature where I worked uh, 
I worked briefly in the state house in 1989 had um, had its own cable TV channel. So like uh, some ways, uh, so some ways we're we're way behind the time. I'm, I know we're an old organization. We're conservative. I understand that. Understand that. And but I think uh, there's many many changes we've made. And so the pandemic's a terrible thing. But at least it's a blessing insofar it has actually goaded us into uh, taking some action, update the way we do things. And I certainly uh, think a lot of the innovations we were forced to make is otherwise we couldn't function at all um, is uh, I think it's long overdue. And I'll also say uh, I'm on the Judiciary Committee. The clerk does occasionally uh, come to visit us. He's, I don't think he's ever said we're his favorite committee, although um, I know he, I know, uh, although he's always very gracious and helpful when he comes to see us, just as he was uh, when he came, just as he is when he comes to see you. But he's never told us he's his favorite committee. And also we're in charge of 91A, the open meetings law, the right to no law and our laws are somewhat stricter in other states, which has impeded, I think, our legislators from doing some of the things. But uh, we but um, we still have broad discretion. We're not, uh, we actually do our own 91A enforcement because of the, uh, you know, just because the separation of powers. And in some ways uh, we're a lot less, the standards of transparency we set for ourselves are in many ways uh, much, uh, we're much less, we're much more opaque than a lot of the uh, a lot of the bodies who we make the laws outside the legislature make the laws for us. So I think this uh, committee is a great idea. I'm almost tempted to suggest we make it a standing committee that uh, goes on forever, except a lot of those standing committees are uh, kind of get kind of a kind of stagnant. So, uh, so I think this, this committee is a great idea. It's long overdue and um, there's a lot of changes we have to make. And so we, we, we need to, there's a lot of things we need to catch up with. Um, so, that's all I have to say. And I'm um, also, I'm trying to speak on the next bill. So you might want to just, so you can either take me off the panel and then put me on again then, or just leave me on whatever is easier. So that's what I have to say. And I guess I'll take any questions if anybody has any. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions for Representative Corrigan? Yeah. I don't see any. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, next we have uh, Heather Stockwell. Heather, available? There you are, I think. I'm here. Just takes a few minutes to oh, the transfer oh. over. Thanks for um, taking the time to listen to my testimony today. I really um, appreciated some of uh, Representative Horrigan's historical context. Um, I, um, I'm the daughter of Representative uh, Steve Avery, who served in the House uh, until 2002. He was running for a ninth term in 2002, and um, his drive and my drive now is an hour each way to Concord. Uh, so a two-hour commitment uh, to, to, <laughs> to, to testify, uh, generally speaking. So I am obviously in support of this bill, I guess, at this point. Um, I, um, even though it doesn't always, in some ways it, it benefits me and in other ways it doesn't. Um, it makes my job easier in many ways. I can show up and sign into to more bills than I was really previously able to do. It also means I'm not working in my car or a coffee shop or in the cafeteria of the state house, which at this point is unsafe for me to do any of those things. Um, I would say uh, some of the other upsides are that uh, there's less wear and tear in my car now. Um, and there's also, of course, the environmental impacts of not having all these people driving around sort of needlessly. Um, so, but that also means that I don't get reimbursed for mileage. And I know that that is part of the um, expenses or what you are reimbursed for as state reps, um, even though that may be fairly negligible. Um, it has also allowed me to put that money towards my car's expenses. So I do see that part as, as a negative. Um, but I think, there's, I, I think there's a lot of cost savings for the state, even though I also understand there are, are costs associated with running um, running this kind of program, but I, what I'm seeing so far is that, um, yes, our supporters uh, working for a nonprofit, I work for Rights and Democracy, and I am a registered lobbyist in the state of New Hampshire. Um, just want to be clear about that. Um, a lot of my job has been expressed uh, by others that work in the nonprofit industry today. We, we work with people who are being affected by the legislation 
that is being passed by the state. And so uh, many of those people are working during these hours and taking multiple, you know, a full day off instead of maybe only a half day or just rearranging their schedule to work different hours. So I think this is good for democracy and it's good for the state of New Hampshire. And I encourage everyone here to please support this bill. Thanks so much. Thank, Have a great day. thank you for your testimony. Uh, are there any, would you take questions? Sure, if there are any. Are there any from the committee? Anyone on Zoom? I see none, thank you again. Must have done a great job. Um, could I bring up Kathleen Kelly? Kathleen, can you join us? I can. Thank you very Hi. much, Chairman. Welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to speak remotely from Randolph, New Hampshire, which is in the southern part of Coas County. My name is Kathleen Kelly, representing myself, and I'm speaking in favor of HB 558. The National Conference of State Legislators have done research on how to securely um, do this kind of technology. They've identified the staffing needs, the technology, the applications that are used often by other states. We should have a law and a permanent rule that participation in the general court committees and general legislative meetings are possible through online access or live cam or whatever we wanna call it other than the brand name. Though the house rules can be changed by majority vote, this year's legislature, I don't think will be willing to consider the safety and the accessibility of the legislative process as it moves forward. As this bill suggests, New Hampshire needs to study the training needs, the evaluation of staffing, technology, and software that's available. We do need to identify the administrative costs and look at other states for models. But for me, being able to participate today physically would require a four hour round trip on a snowy day. I'm a 65 year old with a compromised health and I'm limiting my exposure to COVID. I've had my first shot, thank you very much but um, I'm not there yet. And I really am concerned about going out of my bubble. It also tests my driving ability as I get older. There are many community leaders older than I that are disabled or unable to drive to Concord for hearings. They usually don't consider running for office for the same reason. There are no taxis and no Ubers from Coas to Concord. What we normally do is call our neighbor and say, hey, I'm going. In fact, my husband and I, a few years ago, were, felt so strongly about a certain uh, action being taken. We drove six other active voters down to Concord on a snowy, wintry day to speak on the bills. On the way, we experienced glare ice in Franconia Notch, cars off on either side of the road. Um, many of my fellow neighbors have talked about being able to participate this year as a wonderful thing. They've testified for or against bills online. My son is a newly elected young representative for New Hampshire in this region. And he's managing a small business, working full time and doing his duties as a representative for the Berlin region. He's been able to participate in more committee meetings because of the online access. He does have to travel though tomorrow during a snowstorm and Wednesday to physically attend a house meeting. This is an unnecessary risk to his life. Of course, I'm his mom and I think that's awful. <laughs> but I've worried about our other co-op leaders over the several years because A, they're older, they have been older and they have to drive several days in a week in January, February, and March. Many COAS um, disabled veterans and community leaders are unable to run for office or to speak to bills because they can't drive. And they're brilliant and they're wonderful people that should be heard. We have over 10% of the house now, I think under the age of 40. And I assume they're all raising families and working hard. New Hampshire will be a better place with their voices included in the process 
through these tools that are available readily and securely. Many other states are further along than New Hampshire, so it can be done. Please support HB 558. Kathleen Kelly, and I've got my testimony written and I can submit it to you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for uh, Ms. Kelly? Seeing none, thank you very much for testifying. Thank you. I think we are all set. No hands up. Um, so with that, I'll close the testimony on House Bill 558. And where are we on time? See how well I do at scheduling. Um, we are then heading to CACR5 as soon as the clerk can get us ready. You're good. She is good. Um, with that, I'll open the testimony on CACR5, which is listed as uh, provision for compensation of legislators to be removed by uh, concurrent constitutional amendment. Uh, with that, I will call the prime sponsor, uh, Representative McWilliams. Are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome to Legislative Administration. Thanks. It's lovely to see you again, um, Chair Hill and members of the Le Legislative Administration Committee. Um, this bill is very simple. Uh, wait, let me back up. Um, for the record, my name is Representative Rebecca McWilliams. I represent Merrimack 27, which is the west side of Concord. Um, so this bill is very simple, um, perhaps deceptively simple, because I'm sure there are many lively debate topics that could be uh, pulled out from this bill. But uh, in essence, all this bill does is decouple legislator pay from the New Hampshire Constitution. It pulls it out. Um, and so, as you already know, uh, other key government officials, such as our governor, um, have their pay as an RSA. Um, it falls under RSA 94, um, and it is managed uh, through a series of uh, brackets for uh, how the pay is in uh, highest and lowest numbers. They get updated from time to time for inflation, but are appropriately addressed uh, for what our changing economy and needs happen in the state. Um, so there are plenty of reasons why legislator compensation should be taken out of the constitution. Um, and as I said, there are plenty of other arguments that could happen ancillary to this, uh, but I just wanna give some personal testimony as to what that means to me as a legislator and representative. Um, so I'm 38 years old, I'm under 40. So I'm considered one of those young reps that was mentioned in the prior bill testimony. Um, I have three children. Um, my husband and I run a family business. We run a farm. Um, and I also work off farm as an attorney. Uh, I'm able to serve as a legislator because I am fortunate enough to be self-employed and to be able to structure my time in order to uh, serve remotely this year. Uh, but when we don't have COVID going on, uh, actually attend things at the state house and, and be involved. Uh, for many of my peers, that is not possible. Um, and if I were to take a 40 hour a week job, uh, which considering COVID and financial issues could happen, um, it would be unlikely that I could both work 40 hours a week as a 38 year old and also serve as a representative. So um, realistically, I'm probably considered to be in my prime earning years right now. This is the time when I should be investing in an IRA, 401k, saving for retirement, and the reality is it's a huge time commitment for me to do what I do at the state house. And I love it. And I do it because I care about my constituents, but there is certainly a cost because that time that I spend could be time that I'm spending elsewhere, putting away money for the future. 
So understanding that and understanding that the work that we all do as representatives should be compensated. And of course, our forefathers also thought that it should be compensated. They put $200 in the constitution. Uh, so there was this intent to compensate. It's just, it's been so difficult for us to change that. Um, it's become a bit of a tradition that we're semi-volunteer, we're proud to serve and the $200, it's not about the money. Well, I'm here to say that because it's not about the money, there is an avoided cost, um, meaning I'm not putting away, my time is not being put towards putting money away for retirement. And that's true for a lot of reps who have to make that decision between working a day job or structuring their time and, and serving in the legislature. And I'm not here to insult anyone who is retired and serving on the legislature. I mean, if I were retired, I probably would serve on the legislature too because I love it. Um, but that's not, of course, the situation for every single person who would like to serve in the state. So this bill is really intended to provide the means by decoupling pay from the constitution to at some point bring up a bill to actually compensate legislators appropriately under chapter 94 for what they're doing. That's not what this bill does. All it does is take out $200. It's simply taking a knife and striking that. I also wanna be very clear because I've had plenty of questions about this. It does not touch mileage. Mileage remains enshrined in the constitution. And so if someone is an elected Senator or representative and is driving to Concord, they still get their mileage. So I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Uh, Chair will call Representative Oregon. Here he is. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. It's good to see you again. Um, I've not much has changed in the last 10 minutes. I continue to be Representative Timothy Horrigan. I continue to represent uh, Bradford County 6, towns of uh, Durham and Manbury, home of, home of your distinguished ranking, uh, ranking minority member. Um, and uh, so Representative Mick Williams, yep, just, she explained it perfectly. It just takes out the part about um, setting the, comp the compensation in the uh, in the Constitution, um, that would enable us to, uh, it, uh, to use an expression which our predecessors in the mid, mid 1880s wouldn't have understood because it wouldn't be coined until the 1960s. But anyway, legislative heart, salaries were hardwired at $100 a year, as we know all too well, into the state Constitution in 1887. And um, actually, ironically, in 1887, throughout the 1880s, there actually was no inflation. But so this seemed like probably a less ridiculous idea back then. Uh, back then than it does now. But even then, that was not really a, a smart idea. And there's not much money even in 1987. We made um, the uh, governor, Governor Charles Sawyer, the governor at the time, made uh, $2,000 a year, which is equivalent to about 55000 in today's uh, dollars. So if we were paid one twentieth of for Sununu's salary, we'd be making $7,185.22 per year, which uh, Still isn't much. In fact, that's less than half of what the executive counselors make, and that's also uh, that's that's a job that's probably not uh, twice as difficult as ours. Um, and it we uh, doesn't mean we can't pay ourselves a salary. We do it in statute law, and actually uh, in RSA 24, we already set our own compensation for our service with the county with our respective county delegations. And there's actually a rather amusing floor fight I saw, and I was here in 2015 and. I actually don't remember it. I was probably hanging around the ante room or something, but there was a, like a long floor fight because there was a bill to raise Coas County to $50, which finally finally passed, but it, it took several reconsiderations and all kinds of things. And a lot of people were very incensed by the idea of like paying even the 10 members from Coas County more than they're making already. Um, but I think it's a good idea. We actually, I'm not a lawyer, unlike Reverend McWilliams, but the way I read the law is if we did nothing, this CACR passed, it was approved by the voters. And if we did nothing at all, I think we'd still get our hundred dollars a year because there's uh, provisions. And undoubtedly there'd probably be some lawsuit from somebody who wanted to take away our hundred dollars a year, but I think there's provision we can't lower. Um, we uh, we have to like say what the salary for position is um, 
in advance. We can't we can't arbitrarily lower it. Um, but anyway, so it'd be controversial. Um, you know, I if, but it's better than the status quo. You know, it's it's absurdly low and it's makes it impossible for most citizens to serve. It's uh, I mean, although I usually tell people, uh, people often comment hundred dollars here, say like, I'm worth every penny of it. Although I um, present company excluded, I do sometimes say like, I'm not sure if all my colleagues are, but all of you are worth well more than hundred dollars a year. So you all do great work. So um, one thing about mileage, it doesn't change anything to do with mileage. And uh, before looking at the old journals, and I've only seen a few of them, but uh, mileage formulas were much more complicated and adjusted for inflation, apparently much more generous than we are now. And the, the previous bill, somebody mentioned like having to take an Uber to the state house to testify. We actually had something to the equivalent to a free Uber account. We used to get in 1909, apparently we had passes that would uh, allow us to ride, well, the steam railroads. So I guess you couldn't ride the trolleys and streetcars they had back then. So we could ride the railroads to Concord for free. And we got I think, 20 cents a mile if we had to walk more than two miles to the train station, which uh, you know, be, that'd be a very sweet deal if we all got a free Uber pass to go to Concord, but that's not how it works. Anyway, and um, there were landmark Supreme Court decisions for 1949 and 1961, which established that legislative mileage payments must have a reasonable relation to cost of travel. So that's why it's uh, since 1963, I think the law is pretty much the same it is now that we, we peg it to the federal uh, federal mileage rate. And even then, both those Actually, there one decision, 49, there are actually two different ones in 1961. Supreme Court justices all observed that the $100 a year salary was extraordinarily low and that it also made it hard for many citizens to serve. So that was like, a, this has seemed ridiculously low for, for decades. Um, so, and as I mentioned before, it's not even that tremendously high even back then in 1987. So that's, uh, so I think this, so I think we should uh, do this CAC, I think we should pass this CACR and then uh, we should, uh, and that would be a very difficult debate. Um, lots of people would be opposed to it, but we, we well, in uh, 2023, when we reconvene, um, I, I hope to be part of the debate in 2023, but I, we don't know, no, but none of us know what's going to be the future. In 2023, we should, uh, you know, set some sort of legislation that uh, sets our salary at a realistic level, um, even if, even if we paid one twentieth of what Sunu makes, a little over seven thousand dollars a year, we would still be one of the lowest paid legislatures in the country. So uh, we would, um, our tradition that would not. Uh, so uh, our tradition would still continue if we did what they if we pegged it to the level that we did back in 1887. But um, so that's uh, that's why I I favor this. This is makes just one change to how our legislature is structured, it's a, uh, which I think is a, I think would be a crucial change. And if anybody doesn't want to take the higher salary, they're free to, uh, they're free to donate it to charity. So um, I certainly happily cash the $200 check every, every January of every even numbered year, like I did. I don't, I'm not ashamed of it, but some people maybe they can do what they want, but I think we should, I think we should pay ourselves a, uh, something approaching a realistic uh, salary so that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Representative Farragut? Seeing none, uh, thank you for your testimony. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think I was, uh, well, let me finish on this one. We have uh, 40 people that have signed up in support, eight opposed. I was neglectful in the last bill to give you that number, so I will go back to that. No other people have been have raised their hands to testify. So I will close the hearing on CACR five and tell you that on H the prior bill, HB five five eight, there were a hundred and five people that testified in support. Um, one that testified, uh, one that uh, uh, signed in opposed. And uh, just the one that was neutral, which was the house clerk. And now, as soon as we can reset, we're good to go. Uh, and we're still behind time, right? No, we're about four minutes behind now. We have some time. Um, I will open the hearing on CACR 11. 
we have hopefully the prime sponsor, Representative Lewicki. Representative Lewicki, you're recognized to speak to your bill. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, some members of this committee are lawyers and have more trust for the court than those of us who come from different backgrounds. I ask all of you to listen with an open mind and consider the clear language of the people's constitution. That's the supreme law we've been given and have sworn an oath to. As legislators, we have no duty or allegiance to decisions of the courts. I come from an engineering background. In my business, if you have to fix something repeatedly, it's an indication there's a flaw in the design. Something is broken in a system where we keep passing constitutional amendments to restore what we already had. To begin, I'll read Article 7 of our Constitution. State sovereignty. The people of the state shall have sole and exclusive right of governing themselves as a free, sovereign, and independent state, and do forever and hereafter shall exercise and enjoy every power, jurisdiction, and right pertaining thereto, which is not or may not hereafter be by them expressly delegated to the United States of America in Congress assembled. Over recent decades, we've had to amend our Constitution numerous times. Rather than changing the Constitution, most of these recent amendments simply restored what had been the status quo before a decision of the courts. These include taxpayer standing, the right to privacy, Articles 2A, 2B, etc. There's an inherent conflict between an activist judiciary and uh, state sovereignty as defined in Article 7. A fickle judiciary that welcomed taxpayer standing in Claremont and then denied it when taxpayers sued over a city's tax cap is not the kind of enduring and predictable institution that should govern New Hampshire citizens. Although the courts claim to be using precedent as the basis for their decisions, the reality is that they pick and choose their precedents. In the present state of the world, it's unrealistic to expect the courts not to be politicized. Presently, the people and their representatives have two ways of dealing with courts when they go astray in constitutional matters, amendment and impeachment. What I'm proposing in Article 11, uh, CACR 11, is a less laborious method for the people to restore the Constitution in cases where the courts have made a wrong decision on a constitutional matter. Um, Article 7, cited above, is the plain English of our Constitution. Words that aren't found in our Constitution are precedent, stare decisis, and co-equal. These are legal constructs created by courts. They may be useful to the courts, but they are clearly inferior to the people's Constitution. When they are used by the courts to subvert the plain language of the Constitution, they are anathema. Uh, from Quoting from Wikipedia, one of the most important roles of precedent is to resolve ambiguity, ambiguities in other legal texts, such as constitutions, statutes, and re regulations. The process involves, first and foremost, con consultation of the plain language of the text. Once again, plain language of the text, as enlightened by the legislative history of enactment, subsequent precedent, and experience with new interpretations of similar text. It's said that precedents make the law predictable and knowable to lay people. However, the converse is often true. If the courts are free to pick and choose among precedents and to ignore pieces of the Constitution and statutes that don't suit their whim, then the use of precedents to justify their position is essentially an overturning of the Constitution and elected government. The court's addicts full of precedents aren't limited to those created by New Hampshire courts. In deciding Claremont, the court looked to our neighbor to the south to find a precedent that suited their whim. By that standard, when any court anywhere creates a precedent, then any other court may use the invented precedent to overturn their state's constitution. When our constitutions were first enacted in 1784 and 1789, they were the philosophy of freedom and self-government put into words. To quote Thomas Paine, one of the philosophers of that time, precedent law is one of the vilest systems that can be set up. Here we are, 237 years later, and our Constitution has been supplanted by precedent law. The people's representatives have become inferior to unelected judges. I ask the committee to vote off to pass on the CACR and take one step toward restoring self-government and the people's Constitution. I ask the members of the committee to work with me toward this end. Although it may not happen this year or this session, it's a goal that we need to achieve to return to self-government. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. That's all I have. Thank you, thank you, um, Can you uh, forward that testimony to us? Yes, I did. I emailed it to the committee an hour or so ago. Excellent. We're all quickly scrambling. I didn't see it in my email. I didn't know if anyone else did. Um, but at any rate, thank you. Are, are you willing to take questions? Certainly. Are there any questions for the representative in the committee room? 
Seeing none, any online or Zoom? Seeing Hedrick, you're, you're off the hook, Representative. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I don't see any others that have signed up. We have one candidate here, John Tobin. John Tobin? Mr. Tobin? Say to Mr. Tobin, Mr. Tobin, are you unmuted? I'm here. I'm here. I'm sorry. It took me a minute to unmute. Uh, oh. Yes, my, my name is John Tobin. Thank you very much for recognizing me and giving me this opportunity. Um, I'm a retired lawyer. I was also a volunteer court mediator. Um, and I'm, I submitted some testimony to uh, all of you an hour or so ago by email. Um, and I won't repeat all of that. I hope you received it. Um, and um, I want to speak briefly about the separation of powers problems with this proposal, but more importantly, the practical problems. Um, we have a system of separation of powers and system of checks and balances, which has worked well. And it inevitably, there's inevitably some tension um, in competition between the legislative branch and the judicial branch and the executive branch. Um, but your role as uh, the legislature is really, in lots of ways, the, the largest and most expansive one. You set policy, you create law, um, you create the budget, you determine the structure of state government. The court role is, is much more circumscribed. It decides specific disputes between parties in particular cases by determining the facts and then applying the law. Um, and in many, many cases all the time, the courts apply the Constitution. They apply it in criminal cases, in zoning cases, in tax cases, in cases governing the powers and the authority of state governments. So they're doing that all the time. Um, and this proposal would essentially turn the legislature into a, an appeals court. Anytime anybody was unhappy with a decision in their cases involving zoning or their conviction um, in a criminal case or some other dispute, and they didn't like the outcome, they would then be able to turn to the legislature, hire a lobbyist, and try to persuade you to undo the court decision. You would be creating an end run in particular cases for parties in a court case. And while one party might very much be eager to try that end run, it would mean a delay for the other party. And that other party might be a state government. It might be a private business. It might be um, an individual. Uh, it might be a local town. They are going to have to wait um, until this new super appeals process in the legislature goes forward. And then under this proposal, even if the lobbyist or whomever persuades both houses of the legislature to um, do this end run around the appeals decision, then it goes to a referendum to the whole state, which I'm assuming would be um, once every two years when um, state elections are held, which means, again, another delay in the outcome of this case, which one party may like, but would be very unfair to the other parties. So, and you have plenty of things to do. You have laws to write, a budget to, to construct. Um, you don't really need to become an appeals court because one party is unhappy with the decision. And most importantly, you have ample power to address court decisions you don't like. If you think they've misinterpreted the statute, you can rewrite the statute. If you think they've misinterpreted the constitution, you can propose a constitutional amendment. That's how the system was designed to work. That's checks and balances in its essence. And this proposal would make you into an appeals court. It would delay things for many people in many cases. Um, it would really uh, usurp the court's role. So for all those reasons, I uh, respectfully urge you to um, designate this as inexpedient to legislate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tobin. Uh, are you willing to take questions? Absolutely. Are there any questions for Mr. Tobin? 
attorney Tobin. Uh, any online or on Zoom or by telephone? I think you're off the hook as well. Thank you very much for taking the time and legislative administration. Thank you very much for recognizing me. Good luck today. Thank you. No other hands raised. Um, I will tell the committee that we had three people in support, uh, 57 people opposing, no neutral. That didn't include the speakers. Uh, with that, I will close the testimony on CACR 11. Look at that, right on time. Uh, so here's what I propose to the committee. Uh, I would like to uh, say that we'll, we'll take an hour for lunch, uh, come back at 11, at one o'clock and, um, and hold an exec session on the bills that we heard this morning. Um, I'm assuming, and I'll see a nodding head, I think, from, uh, from Representative Lay uh, holding a caucus um, somehow, some way, and, uh, and the Republicans will do likewise in the committee room, and we shall meet again at 1 o'clock here. Uh, everything good? Anyone have a comment or question? Yep, Representative Lay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just uh, let the Democrats on the committee know I will send a Zoom invite out and we can do a quick caucus, maybe at, uh, I don't know, 10 to 1, something like that, quarter to 1. Is that okay, everybody? Quarter, uh, hold on, Representative Lay. Uh, quarter to 1, he is sending out an invitation for a Zoom. Yeah. Just for, the, for our caucus, just to do our caucus real quick. Sounds good. You said we're going to, the, the committee will reconvene at 1 o'clock, correct? One o'clock. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. Oh, I, is that another hand I see from? No. Okay. We're all set. Thanks very much. Thank you. We want to shut off the. Representative Rich.
Hello, Mr. Chairman. Um, I I know I can't hear you, but I hope you can hear me. Can you unmute and let me know what your plans are? Are you done for the day? You need to unmute at the uh, computer in the front of the room. Uh, this is Representative Smith. Um, we're, we're planning to come back at one o'clock for executive session.
Just a reminder to those in the room, um, you, you need to unmute the uh, computer up in front before anybody else can hear you. So I don't know if um, you're waiting till after one, but, but you're still muted. So, so for those in the room, whenever you're ready. Okay, mics are live. Excellent. Let's see. Oh, there's that play. I will require everyone on uh, on Zoom to have be on video for voting purposes. That's how does one do that? It's a great question. <laughs> I click on the start video and it says your camera is not launched properly. Please check browser media or something or other. Mr. Speaker, what do we want to do? What's up? Sorry. Uh, Betsy McKinney is on telephone, I okay. guess. Or no, her video is not working. The only exception that we decided on last week was if we were on video, that go. Other than that, let us see your face. So do we take her vote anyway? Or can't? I would object. I, can't I would object, Mr. Chairman. I mean that that's the the rule is the rule. Yeah. You're either on or you're not. Yep. Who's the other one on the right? I can't read that. Let me go. Uh, I'll go out and see if I can get on again. Okay. Um, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure it's going to make much of a difference here today, but. No, I don't either, but I'm trying to read the one. What's the, what's the block on the lower left? That's me. Um, oh. There's, there's Bob Green and one that just says Christopher and it's spelled weird. He, he's our IT guy. I guess. Oh, okay. And Pam. So we'll just see if Betsy can pull herself into. Oh, I'm eating a yogurt. Sorry, I didn't want to be on screen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm finishing lunch. Starting 
Let's see back. No. There we go. No, that's done. I think we're good anyway. We'll see if Betsy can come back on. Um, a little bit late opening the exec session. Uh, and we'll start with. Where it go? Oh, my God. Is that you? Hey, hey, yes, yes. Hi, uh, 156, right? Yes. So I'll open the exec section on House Bill 156, and I'll ask Representative Green for a motion. I'd like to make a motion to ITL HB 156. There a second? Second by Clear. Representative Wall. Oh, she went scan and said it? Okay. Um, oh, okay. And would you like to speak to your motion? Or just, uh, just briefly, we heard some great testimony from uh, House Clerk Paul Smith that uh, this already this issue is already under development. The cost of putting amendments in that just manner up on the website. Um, so uh, the screen shared with us this morning shows us that it's pretty far along. I don't think we. Not much more has to be done, perhaps, but it's, it's well under development. So we may not need to modify this process. Is there any other discussion? Representative Blake. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I couldn't quite hear everything there. I don't know if the, the sound is not quite working very well. Um, I would say that I oppose uh, the ITL. I will oppose the ITL. Um, I have already been in hearings this session where a major amendment uh, transforming a bill is presented, um, even in the public hearing, uh, and the public has no access to it. The committee just gets it maybe 30 minutes in advance and the public has no access. That includes the public who are scheduled to testify on that very bill, um, which is now about to be transformed. So um, I don't except that uh, the clerks, I know the clerk is working hard, but I do not think that this system that he currently has up and running uh, meets that need. I am all for as much transparency as possible. Um, and I think that, um, I also would point out that as the clerk himself said, rules can be changed um, and procedures can be changed. And I prefer to see this in statute um, to maximize uh, public transparency uh, of the workings of the general court. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion, Representative Wall? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I apologize to the whole committee. I have put my TL first, but um, I've had a discussion during the break. And I have been taking this as being a work product that really didn't need to be put out there as a work product. But looking over the bill and all, it comes after there's been discussion and uh, acceptance by the committee. So, no. I was trying to be bipartisan. If someone else would second that, I'd be pleased. Thank you. I'll second that. I think we have Representative Rulard seconding, um, and you will withdraw your motion. I apologize. Yep, no worries. Any further discussion? Uh, yep. Oh, Senator, uh, Representative Smith, no? I almost got a promotion there. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Still the same pay, though. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would, um, I think it's great that our clerk is ahead of the curve um, in trying to get, you know, some sort of a system implemented to, to track committee amendments online. Um, but he can't speak and we can't speak for future clerks. You know, whoever comes after our current clerk might not have the same dedication to transparency and, you know, getting the technology on board with this sort of thing. And without something in writing, uh, there's nothing to stop them from backtracking on some of these, you know, areas of progress that we'd be making. Um, so for, for that reason alone, I would, I would strongly support passage of this. Um, but in addition, I, I would just remind the committee that 100% of the sign-ins from the public were in support of passing this bill. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Representative Green? Yes. Representative McKinney? Yes. Representative Packard? Yes. Representative Osborne? Yes. Representative, Representative Rulliard? Yes. Clerk votes yes. Representative Simon? Yes. Representative Wall? The motion to demo is on to Yes. Uh, no, the representative motion is yeah. Okay, that's where I corrected myself. I apologize again. Um, I'm voting no. Representative Lay? No. Representative Smith? No. Representative Frost? No. Representative Nutting Long? No. Representative Richards? No. Representative Espedia? No. And Representative Hill? Yes. Okay, the motion um, is passed to ITL 8 7. Uh, minority report? Yes, uh, Representative Frost will do that. We're going to say by tomorrow meantime. That's fine, Mr. Chair. I email it to you, is that correct? And that, to Pam? That would be wonderful. Okay. Adjourned. All right. All right. Uh, closes 156. Let's go to 190. Is that right? Um, Representative Wall, would you like to move on? Yes, I that would be, passed. then you can be really sure of the outcome. <laughs> <laughs> this time I can be really sure, yeah. <laughs> Let's hope the rest of us are. <laughs> I move on to pass, please. Uh, is there a second? I'll Rep second. Representative Frost, would you like to speak to your motion? Well, I, this bill was put in on behalf of the Ethics Committee. Um, it's been a long time coming. It's a burden on the staff to have to have us do these forms every single year. It's a burden on the legislators to do it every single year. Notification so that people will know if there's a change in their uh, financial situation in some way that they need to disclose information, that they should do that, which they should now anytime. So um, this will just be a good, clean measure for us. It's housekeeping essentially. Long overdue, and I strongly support it. Anyone else like to speak on the option pass motion? Seeing none, we'll ask Representative you. Smith has his hand up. Oh, thank you. Sorry, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll try and chime in verbally uh, in the future. Um, I, I just say that I, I oppose the bill uh, because I generally oppose anything that rolls back uh, transparency and financial reporting, um, but it'll probably end up like 16 to one and I don't need a minority report. Um, but I, I just think that, you know, we need to be very careful anytime we reduce um, financial disclosures and transparency for legislators and public officials. Excellent. Uh Representative Wall. Without getting into debate, um, my friends, um, we are not rolling back transparency. All of this information goes online. As you all know, it's all right out there for the world to see. And the only thing that's changing is when we report. If someone chooses not to report something, that's violating transparency. But it, it's absolutely transparent when we fill out our financial disclosure forms at all times for everybody. And I'm the last person who would want to violate transparency. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Seeing none, 
I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on House Bill 190 relative to financial disclosures by legislators. Representative Green? Yes. Representative McKinney? Yes. Representative Packard? Yes. Representative Osborne? Yes. Representative Brulliard? Yes. Clerk votes yes. Representative Simon? Yes. Representative Wall? Yes. Representative Lay? Yes. Representative Smith? No. Representative Frost? Yes. Representative Nutting Wong? Yes. Representative Richards? Yes. Representative Stevia? Yes. Me? The chair? <laughs> yes. It's a common, it's a common thing, don't let it work. And I'll, I'll say, Mr. Chairman, no need for a minority report, and I'm fine with consent. Oh, good. Thank you. It consent. passes 14 1. Consent 14 to 1. Oh, my God. Excellent. Moving on. Um, next is uh, Bill 509, right? Yeah. Um, I'd like to uh, kind of go a little out of norm here. Um, we have uh, Terry Paff with us in, in committee room for you folks on Zoom that can't see. And, um, and Terry has some information about um, a question that came up on this bill about the flag specifically. So uh, with, with the committee's indulgence, I'd like to see what Terry can help us with and as far as the flags go. Sure. Pardon my back. Actually, I gotta move this way. Sure. Uh, whatever you you can move that any way you'd like. Oh, okay. You can even cool. spin if you would like. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do I have to yeah, I think these guys have to <laughs> Okay. So I know. It? <laughs> this is theater in the round. Apparently. All right. Well, it's been around. To sit in a corner or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, the question, I don't know the specific question, so if you can enlighten me for the record, my name is Ter Terry Poth. I'm the Chief Operating Officer currently for the General Court in New Hampshire. Um, I have an office here in the State House. So uh, we have a question from Representative Rulak. Coming. Certainly, Representative. Uh, when I saw the bill, I questioned whether or not Terry Bath had been involved with this yes. and was supportive of the bill. Very much so. Specifically with regard to the flag issue. Right. And that's what we needed to know. So, yep. would you well, tell us? Uh, certainly, I'm very much in support of this. I think it gives the authority back to the legislative branch where it belongs with us. Uh, it is in consultation with the uh, historical folks and the executive branch, but all this brings the control back and well, clarifies the control actually for uh, the spaces in the LOB, the Upham Walker House and, and the State House itself. Anything under legislative control is currently um, under legislative control, but there's always been a little question between the executive and a little friction between the executive and the legislative. And this clarifies that the legislative branch is in fact in charge of those spaces and the flags in particular. They were gifted the, the, the flags were gifted to the legislative branch and brought here for display in that hall of flags. And that's, uh, that's where they've been. Uh, they, they've gone through a, uh, several iterations. They've been posted and they've got some cases built in the late 1800s. Uh, they've been in there. There's currently a long standing debate on how to tend to those flags and how to best preserve those flags. I've been involved with that as, uh, uh, as, as Representative Wall and others, uh, um, Representative Welch, and many, many members, long-serving members of this legislature that are very, very concerned about the condition of the flags and how they're being treated. We've went out and uh, talked with other states who have had preservation efforts go forward with those. They've had mixed results in them with them. These flags show no fabric debris at all on the basis of the 
cases or anything uh, in that area. But um, textile experts do say there are, there should be some sort of uh, preservation of those. But the fact of the matter is that they were given to us to have them played and so that the remembrance of what happened in those battles and the stories that those flags tell could be seen by the general public in almost every fourth grade class that comes through here. Um, so it's very important, I think, to this legislature, to this general court, those flags stay in the cases the way they are with, with monitoring like's happening now to, to see what the best preservation and in the future, hopefully there's something that can treat those flags without taken away or backing them or hiding them in a closet somewhere or hiding them in an archive somewhere. Because those, uh, those were active flags. And so this bill brings it back so that the control is with our own legislative historical committee. Mala? Thank you very much. That was why we wanted you here to have you confirm everything you just said. Thank, Thank you, you. Representative. Chairman, that's it. Uh, no other questions? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Fine, Representative. Yep. Representative Wall, would you like to make a motion? I'd like to bipartisan vote on this one, please. Um, I'll I'm, see what I can do. <laughs> we'll see how we <laughs> try. I move by to pass, please. By uh, second. Representative Ruler. Do you want me to second? I don't care. Uh, fine by me. I'll second. Um, so we have a ought to pass motion on House Bill 509. Um, any further discussion or would you like to speak to your bill? All I can say is I am grateful that the Chief Operating Officer came in to clarify everything. Um, this committee uh, that's asking for this bill, the Joint Historic Committee, is a long-standing committee with deep affection and commitment to everything that's here and the buildings that we have, to preserving, conserving these items. And that has been made over the years to respond to people who are concerned about the flags that we sold up in the, in, uh, the Hall of Flags. And as our Chief Operating Officer said, we have conservation textile experts coming from out of state and around the state um, to inform us and educate us and discuss with us what our options are. Um, it is not an issue that is dead. It's an issue that will come up year after year until some decision is finally made. Um, other states have done things such as taking their flags out of display, putting them in drawers, you know, flat out one at a time, and putting replicas up. It's not quite the same. Uh, the flags that we have in the Hall of Flags are very near and dear to people's hearts, and the children who come in to see them are enthralled because they see these flags that really went into battle and what happened to them. And um, so I, I could go on and on about the flags, but this whole bill is very, very important just for clarifying responsibilities to all the artifacts that we have here in our campus. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Any other comments? Seeing none, I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Representative Green? Yes. Representative McKinney? Yes. Representative Packard? Yes. Representative Osborne? Yes. Representative Rulliard? Yes. Clerk votes yes. Representative Simon? Yes. Representative Wall? Yes. Representative Lay? Didn't hear sorry, you. Sorry, yeah, yes. Representative Smith? Yes. Representative Frost? Yes. Representative Nutting Wong? Yes. Representative Richards? Representative Richards? Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> Representative Spedia? Yes. And Representative Hill? Yes. 15 0. Yes. Consent, anyone object? No objection.
Uh, close on 509. Open on House Bill. Are you ready? Um, House Bill 558, which is establishing a committee to study the use of information technology and in legislative process. Recognize uh, Representative Simon for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to make a recommendation that we retain this bill. Second for. Oh, oh. Representative Lay has something he wants to say. Oh. He might want to say. Representative Lay. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. So the motion is to retain? Yes. Yeah. We're looking for. Uh, I mean, uh, the only thing I was going to say is there were a couple of small, a number of small technical things that we wanted to see about having time to amend. Uh, the bill on. Um, so I guess by retaining, we certainly would have that time. Uh, so, okay, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Was that a second, Representative Lay? No, I wasn't seconding. Uh, <laughs> I, just, I, I just was letting you know what, I, <laughs> that's why I asked if the motion, I, I kind of meant, well, had the motion been seconded? Uh, if you have somebody else to second, that's fine. Uh, seconded by Representative Green. Uh, any discussion, Representative? Uh, I think Representative Lay said basically <laughs> said what I was going to say. There are a few minor issues on this bill that uh, we'd like to address uh, potentially with amendments. So uh, we wanted to keep it in house so that we would have time to do that. Thank you, Representative Wall. Okay, uh, I, I call on one to retain it, and I understand what Representative Lay wants to do with it. Give him. On it. Have a subcommittee or how long this go in terms of um, I would anticipate that we would have we would form a subcommittee okay. and fix fix those issues there were some that were listed that were talked about actually I think it was representative Lay that mentioned uh, one county being being mentioned and not others um, some question about remote remoteness. I have something to say from here in first, please. I might not speak then. Yes, it's handled. Yes, I see that. I was finishing the answer to the question. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> there was um, there was also some question about whether they had House and Senate was listed in there. There were a number of things that uh, that seemed to need um, additional review. So that was the purpose. Representative Lay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would suggest actually, um, if you want to work on the bill that we not retain it at this point, that um, we just not make any motion for the moment. And, um, you know, you can go ahead and uh, appoint a subcommittee and maybe we can make the adjustments to it that would meet everybody's satisfaction. Because I, correct me if I'm wrong, if we retain at this point formally, um, are we retaining it then for this entire year and it cannot be reported back until 2022? Um. Thank you for the question. It, as far as I'm concerned, it would come back in the in the second year of this biennium. So it would come back uh, in November. So if I may continue, I, I would suggest, I think the issue is important enough that um, I don't necessarily think we should push it off for a year, but I do think that the bill needs some, some, some amending, some technical amendments, I would say, and maybe even a little more than technical. Um, I would hope that we would be willing to at least give it a little more time, take a deeper look at it and see whether or not there's anything we can do with it that might um, allow it to pass this year um, and get underway this year, just simply because the issue is a live issue and continues to be an important issue. Thank you. Thank you for your information. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, hand Mr. Chairman. Uh, um, yes, Representative Smith is it? Yep, um, I would. I would sort of echo what Representative Lay said. Um, I agree. I think there's a few uh, commas that need to be moved in the in the text, uh, but nothing that that can't be resolved with what's probably going to be a fairly simple committee amendment. Um, I don't see any need to push this off for an entire year. Um, it's something that we could resolve just by closing the exec session on it and re-execing it you know, a week or two from now at our, at our next exec session. Um, and, and I would point out that even if we ourselves do not find ourselves in a hurry, 
on this particular bill, um, the public support was 106 to one. So it's definitely a priority for the public. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any other comments? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your patience. Um, the only thing I would say is we're, it's one of the first bills we're hearing. So rather than retain it, if we, it's one of the first bills we're hearing. So rather than retain it, if we do take a few weeks or a few days to work on it with a subcommittee and then come back, perhaps we could move the one get it out of here. Just to Thank you. Uh, my only comment is that uh, as noted in the beginning of the of the hearing, we've we've already been behind on, on scheduling here. We've uh, because we had no early bills, we were asked to uh, put aside our hearings until uh, after those early bills and the rooms were available. So um, as far as finding additional time and additional space, I'm not sure uh, whether that is possible. And as, and as I say, uh, you know, it, it may have been, um, or maybe I said this in, in our own caucus, but um, a retain means that we can bring it back um, and that we can work on it uh, in the time frame that we have uh, for the committee over the summer um, or even before that. Um, so that would be, that would be my comment. Um, and I'm perfectly willing to listen to others if anyone has any other future comments to make. No, oh, Representative Lay. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, again, I, I don't think this will take much time. I understand what you're, and I, I recognize what you're saying in terms of a, uh, a bit of a time crunch, um, but I believe we have a number of bills scheduled next week, which I think will take a little bit longer. And I expect that to be a, a bit more of a, length, a lengthier day than today was. Um, but beyond that, I don't believe we have anything. Uh, maybe one bill, the statutory uh, committee's bill. Um, and so this would just simply be a, a brief meeting of a subcommittee um, and construction of a, a, what I see is really just technical amendment uh, to the bill. Um, so I again, I would, I would ask that, the, that you consider with a withdrawal of the second and a withdrawal of the retain motion. Um, if it is not withdrawn, I will say I will vote against retaining. Mm -hmm. I believe we should have a chance to act on it this Thank you, Representative. Any other questions? Just a, just a question of clarification, actually, for Representative Lay. Um, just looking at this as a um, establishing a committee, even if it were to pass, even if we were to get this exact quickly and pass through, um, what practical manifestation would that have for this year? I mean, presently we're able to... Um, operate this way under the emergency orders, um, assuming that those change before the end of this session, would there actually be time for there to be a meaningful adjustment to the way that we operate this year, even if we got this study committee through it? So uh, with that, is that addressing your thoughts or do you have things that I'm just missing? If I may respond, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, no, I don't, I don't expect that this study committee would be um, acting in such a way that it would be making changes that would take effect this year in 2021. I mean, the report date itself, I believe, is November of 2021. Instead, I just think that um, since the state of emergency will come to an end at some point, um, I do believe that the sooner we begin to address some of the larger long-term issues about remote access and public access, um, once we are beyond the state of emergency, I think that's what this study committee would be attempting to do. And putting it off for a year, I think, um, just puts us into 2022, when hopefully the state of emergency is no longer in effect. Um, and, you know, I just think that we're, we're just kicking the can down the road. I do think that um, this, is a, this needs to be looked at by the, the legislature. Um, and so I just think uh, it makes sense to at least begin the process now. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion on the floor of retain. Uh, is there any more discussion? Seeing none, I will ask the clerk all the roll. Representative Green? Yes. Representative McKinney? Representative McKinney? Uh, you're muted. Yes. 
Representative Packard? Yes. Representative Osborne? Yes. Representative Rulliard? Yes. Clerk votes yes. Representative Simon? Yes. Representative Wall? No. Representative Lay? No. Representative Smith? No. Representative Frost? No. Representative Nutting Wong? No. Representative Richards? No. Representative Espedia? No. Representative Hill? Yes. Passes 8-7. Eight, 8-7 seven. Eight, seven for retain. Uh, I'm assuming minority report. I don't know. Do we do any reports? I mean, it's just That's a retain. Right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> so, Thank you. That's why I pushed on this one, you see. Uh, I don't have to write anything. Fire engine going by, quite <laughs> frankly. So. Um, next, we have CACR5. CACR5. Um, and I will entertain a motion. Representative Green? I'd like to make a motion that the ITL is here for Second. Okay, I have a motion of ITL and a second from Representative Sheehan. Um, would you like to speak to your motion? Sure. Uh, I break and I would say friends all the time about our legislature. One of the hallmarks of it is our level of courage. That because of that, it really discourages career politicians and encourages people from all walks of life to participate as we get to say about this and this bond up, which is something it's a system that I would not like to see tampered with, so that's why I decided. Excuse me, um, Mr. Chairman, this is Pam. I think there's, I don't know if Representative Green's computer mic might, might be on or, or something. It, it's, it is difficult to hear Representative yeah, Green. Very hard. Everybody else is fine. So I don't know what uh, may be the issue. A soft talk. Can you hear me now? Is this better? Yes, it is to me. Better-ish. Yes. Yeah. yeah, like I was saying, uh, I brag for my honestly friends all the time while I need to go to the damn sure. That we have a certain level of pay that enables people in all walks of life to serve in the legislature who don't have, that would never have the wherewithal to give a fundraising, for example, to serve in any other state that I'm being in. Um, at a level of pay, too, we, it discourages career politicians. You know, it just encourages people from all walks of life to be part of this process and represent the Constituency, so that's why I'm moving to ITL. Any other comments? Representative Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to support ITL. And the reason I'm doing it is because, again, the citizens of New Hampshire are being well represented the way things are happening now, and I do believe change may come at some point. But if we're going to look at this, it should be part of a whole package as to studying. How many legislators we have, what kind of compensation on legislators get, and put it all together and figure out what can work best for New Hampshire. And right now, this is working, and I don't believe we should withdraw anything from the good people who serve the state. And I can't believe our citizens would really support that. Thank you. Thank you, Rep. Anyone else with comments? Uh, yep. Uh, Representative Green? Yes. Representative Smith. So, um, we have an, an interesting institution, you know, with our, our $100 a year pay set in our state constitution. Um, you know, what, the net effect of that is that we're essentially volunteer legislature. You know, we're, we're essentially unpaid. Um, I, don't, I don't think anyone would, would make a serious argument that our $200 a year, you know, is a, is a serious salary. I mean, for... I think most people in the legislature um, that only serves to cover some of the expenses we incur 
by getting elected. You know, I mean, if, if we want a pad of paper with stationery with the state house letterhead, we, we have to buy it ourselves. You know, we don't, we're not a, a big dollar legislature. Um, I would support this amendment just on the grounds that if we're not going to pay our legislature, let's just not pay us rather than have, you know, all the administrative hassle it takes the state to, to give us $200 um, rather than have it enumerated, you know, in the state constitution as an an anachronism to, you know, 200 years ago when $200 was a real paycheck. Um, You know, we all, we all got that report um, from OLS about the the history of the legislative pay issue. Uh, I read through that. I found it pretty interesting. Um, So, you know, I I think that if we're, if we're not going to pay our legislators, which I mean, we're all here unpaid right now. um, Let's just not pay us though. On on that grounds alone, I'm, I'm happy with, with passing this and and removing it from the state constitution. Um, And, you know, if a future legislature at some point wanted to, to re-examine the issue of whether or not we pay the legislature, um, I, I would find that to be unrelated to the question of whether or not we do this amendment, because at that point it would require, you know, if this doesn't pass, like even if we passed it, if it didn't get ratified by the public and 10 years from now, the state Senate wanted to re-examine the issue, for example, um, it would still take a constitutional amendment. So the net effect one way or the other is that if this ever changes up, down, sideways, at some point, there will have to be a constitutional amendment about it. Um, I'm, I'm happy to have this one in preference to something else that sets up complicated pay formulas, you know, and adds things to the Constitution, like mathematical formulas and stuff that really don't belong there. Um, and additionally, I, I would again mention that the support from the public that signed in was five to one in support of this amendment. Um, I didn't think that many people were going to notice or care that we had an amendment up uh, to remove the $200 from our state constitution. Um, but, it, you know, and I, I was kind of neutral about it until I saw all those, all those names. Uh, but that, that kind of buttresses my position. I, I would, I would support this you know, on the grounds that if we're not going to pay our legislature, let's just not pay us. And if the public wants it, let's just let them vote. And lastly, I I would take issue that the current institution encourages people from all walks of life. The current institution actively discourages people from a large number of walks of life. It is beyond difficult for you know anyone who's working age to serve in the legislature and hold down a job i mean if you've got kids and stuff you got to arrange for child care i mean it, we do not encourage people from all walks of life to serve in our state legislature and if that's how we want to have it that's fine but let's not act like they pay us you know we've all heard the um, heard the joke about uh, you know back in the soviet union they pretend to pay us we pretend to work well, we do a lot of work and we don't get paid for it. Let's stop pretending to pay us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Are there any other comments, questions? Oh, I, do I see it? Yes, Representative PCS. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just, I wanna echo the sentiments of our of my colleague, Representative Smith. I, I think, um, I think that the, you know, our, unlike any other legislative body, we, we really have, we really create some obstacles for people to, to serve um, in this legislature. And one of the, um, you know, I, I support the amendment because I think it would be, it would make it just easier for all of us if we did want to, you know, change, change certain things to just do it in statute instead of within our own constitution. Um, if we wanted to continue to pay us $200 a year, uh, for a term, then we could do that in statute rather than in, in, in our constitution. Um, and so just, you know, the actual, just the technical workings of it would be easier, but I, 
you know, I think one of the biggest issues that I see in my in people in my generation currently serving, it's, it's tough. Um, it's tough on so many of us who want to, you know, own a home and, 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 and have kids um, and, you know, make that question, do I want to serve my community or do I want to have, or do I want to raise a family? Um, so it's, um, speaking for people who are who are in their 20s and 30s who are making those life decisions of figuring out you know if i want to move i have to live in this certain district and this these certain guidelines um and so and then to be and then to be so i could be compensated 200 dollars a term um and so i think it's you know i think we set up a lot of issues and you know breaking down those barriers so that more our body could be truly more representative would be would be huge um as, and I say this as one of the, you know, I think three Latinos who serve in the entire state for, out of 400 state representatives. Um, in so I think you know it's we have we have work we have to do to make sure that people that we are racially um, representative. And I think this would be an active step. And if, even if it wasn't this bill, you know, we could we could find ways to work through it to find solutions. So um, while. You know, while it may not be enough to pass, I'd love to at least retain and think about how we can actually make some changes. But um, yeah, I think um, I will be voting uh, no on the on the ITL. Thank you, Representative. Any other comments, questions from the committee? Seeing none, I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Representative Green. Yes. Representative McKinney. to unmute Representative McKinney. I have to unmute. Yes. Representative McKinney votes yes. Thank you. Representative Packard? Yes. Representative Osborne? Yes. Representative Rular? Yes. Clerk votes yes. Representative Simon? Yes. Representative Wall? Yes. Lake. No. Representative Smith? No. Representative Frost? No. Representative Nutty Wong? No. Representative Richards? No. Representative Espedia? No. Passes 8-6. Oh. Yes. <laughs> nine six. Uh, nine votes yes. To ITL six votes no. Uh, that takes care of CACR five. Um, will there be a minority report? Yes, I don't know exactly who yet. I'll let you know. Okay. Thank you. New time tomorrow. Yes, sir. Um, final bill, CACR 11. Um, this was, we had, um, we, were, we were looking for a motion on this. Uh, who did we have for uh, Representative Simon? Easily forgotten, I guess, Mr. Uh, Chair. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I didn't make a note on that. Case, so. <laughs> I, would, uh, I would like to make a motion to ITL CACR 11. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second that, Mr. Chairman. Representative Smith seconds. Uh, is there any discussion? Uh, there are just way too many problems with this bill to to encapsulate in a short amount of time. Um, but it um, first off messes with our, our balance of powers. Um, it basically removes the responsibility that is already within the legislature uh, where we have systems in place already um, to, to check the judiciary in this place and puts it back on the citizens uh, and really just encourages us even more to um, politicize court decisions through partisanship rather than being concerned about the constitutionality. And I would also add that the bill itself doesn't actually protect um, from unconstitutional measures. A constitutional measure that the court takes can still be overturned um, and reversed. So um, for those reasons and many more, uh, 
I'm going ITL on this one. Thank you. Any other comments? Representative Smith? Yeah, I just um, I'd point out that on on an entirely practical level, you know, even if we we all supported this, um, there's no time limit, so there would be nothing stopping us from like putting up all these referendums for Supreme Court decisions from like the 1860s. Um, that that's entirely unworkable, um, and the the public sign-ins for this were 20 to one opposing it. Um, so I, I'm very happy to second the ITL motion and uh, have us move on. Thank you, Representative. Uh, I uh, I lost a bet with myself. I was going to bet that you were going to put in it that uh, there's no throw, vote threshold. Uh, there's no determination of who's going to write the question for the uh, the Constitution. Does it pass by two thirds? Any of those things. So. <laughs> well, I mean, all that too, but. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, any other further comments, questions? Not seeing none, I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Representative Green? Yes. Representative McKinney? Yes. Representative Packard? Yes. Representative Osborne? Yes. Representative Rulard? Yes. Clerk votes yes. Representative Simon? Yes. Representative Wall? Yes. Representative Lay? Yes. Representative Smith? Yes. Representative Frost? Yes. Representative Nutting Long? Yes. Representative Richards? Yes. Representative Espedia? Yes. Representative Hill? Yes. 15 0. Any objection to consent? Nope. Nope. None. None. We're good to go. Um, so the idea, uh, I'll close the hearing on, or the executive session. Um, so the idea is next Monday um, will be a much more difficult day than today. Um, I think the idea will be that we'll have full hearings beginning at nine o'clock on all of the emergency power bill. Um, I suspect there will be no time to expect any of those, so we'll have one more day. Uh, that should be a short day somewhere in there. But uh, our deadline is March 11th, I think, for all of those to be reported out. So any questions uh, on on next Monday, 11th, uh, the 1st of March? We also, and, and I want to remind everyone that those uh, reports that are owed to me uh, will be tomorrow at noontime. And Representative Lay, I saw our hand quickly. Yeah, um, so that one bill about statutory committees and all of that, is that scheduled? I didn't get that. It's, it, there's one bill about uh, that that eliminates, uh, abolishes certain statutory committees and commissions and just sort of cleans up I, we, we did it last uh, session and it just got lost in the mix. Is that one scheduled for us to hear? Uh, the one on, on, you're right. Uh, hold on. On a uh, statutory committee that we were going to abolish oh. the. We can, with that one that we had last year that didn't go on. Yeah, didn't we? Uh, we can blend that with another bill at some point. And if we don't have something before us, I'll find a Senate bill to put it on. Want to do that? Um, you're right. I don't. Uh, I don't know where that went. Uh, I will have to look at it. I'll, I'll. I'll get in touch with you and circle back. And well, I mean, I think we could certainly, if we're doing one more day of an exec session, we could uh, probably do a brief uh, hearing on it then. I would think. Um, do you remember the number on that? Sixteen ninety four. Uh, Was it sixteen ninety four? No, no, no. The one this this term is. Um, oh shoot. I'd have to look up. I just was looking at them before. Um, 187. 187. 186. 186. 186. That's right. How did that not get in here? Okay. Um, that you're right. That may be the quick uh, executive yeah, hearing and then exec session. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I just didn't want to get lost in the mix. That's all. 
Thanks for bringing that up. That was good. You are uh, I have a quick question for you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, when when do you imagine, if you have a time in mind, um, that the exec sessions next week, next week are going to be? And the, the reason I'm asking is I have a dentist appointment I need to plan around, and <laughs> I, I'm trying to figure out if I actually need to plan around it. I commiserate with that, but I also have no idea what the scheduling is for these rooms. That's the that's the key thing. I don't think I'm getting a head shake over on either side. So uh, as soon as I'll, I'll leave it this way, as soon as I know, you will know. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely. All right. Um, I'll um, accept, accepting a motion to adjourn. Yeah. So. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.